Hey, and welcome to the Mountain Cat Guitars podcast, where we discuss all things guitar related. My name is Doug Meyer, owner of Mountain Cat Guitars, and I've been buying and selling guitars professionally for over 25 years. From boutique guitar and amp builders, vintage guitar dealers and experts, guitar repairmen and luthiers, retailers, manufacturers, and of course, guitar players, we talk to the people who buy, sell, play, and of course, obsess over the things we love most, guitars. Hi, and welcome to Mountain Cat Guitars podcast number nine, which is the continuation of our talk with James Cobra Carbonetti from episode eight. We hope you enjoy it. So let's, well, let's talk about your band. Yeah. So your band is named Caveman. Yeah. And you have been, how long has that been a band now? 2010. Uh, so started the same time as Cobra Guitars. Right. So it was, it was like, yeah, the 2010 was like a crazy year of everything switching. Right. Everyone starting their own thing. Well, I remember it was the weirdest thing because Matt, who was the drummer, was now suddenly the singer. Now he's singing. So we were like, how was Matt? He was a great drummer. One of the best. Yeah. <laughs> we're doing a new record now. He's played all the drums. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. But you have a drummer. Uh, well, we do and don't. Like, we do have our dude, Mikey Jones, who's right. the man, and our other friend, Chris Egan, who's also an amazing drummer. Right. Um, but yeah, we're just in the mix of figuring everything out because Stefan left right. and uh, he's doing his uh, sports thing now right. and which is awesome. And, yeah, that happens with bands. I mean, yeah, it's a big just, commitment because you guys tour a lot. Yeah, it's like you either like to tour or you just don't and you get to a point in your life where you're like, I want to be home. Right. I well, totally get it. I mean, you guys are getting How old are you now? I'm 32 now. Right. So I mean, you're yeah. very young yeah. to be at this point. But you were very young always. You were young, to, yeah. you know, like, but to be 32 and have a fully running guitar business for how many years now? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of crazy. I was thinking about it the other day. I was like, wow, it's been a minute. Yeah. Of like, yeah, I mean, you're still just getting started. Yeah, you know, like, exactly. You know, like, that's finding, about the age most people start building yeah, a career in something. Totally. And know? it's just like figuring it out. And I'm now at the point of you start thinking of things differently, which is great. And, and how many records do you have with Kidman? Uh, we're recording number four right now. Wow. So, yeah, 2010 we did a record. 2011 we did a record. And then our last one was a couple years ago now. And... Uh, yeah, they were all really fun and weird and different. Yeah, exactly. Kind of, thanks. Yeah, you guys have toured did, endlessly. Yeah, we've been on the road a bunch. And the last one we did with our dude Albert DeFiore, um, who's great, and we did it on two inch tape at his studio right by the. Yeah, I still old have to shop. do tape. It's great. You know, it's really fun. You just play different. Tape just sounds different. I mean, yeah. you know, they do amazing things with like you know Pro Tools and all that totally. stuff now. Like it sounds good, but. Something about like the last record I that did thing. at TJ's place, you know, yeah. like, all old stuff. It just has a feel. Totally. It, you know, eventually it's going to have to become digital unless you're pressing the vinyl. It, yeah. yeah, it just has a sound. But I mean, most records, it's just impractical to have a two inch studio. Now. Yeah. There aren't too many left. Yeah, that last record, we kind of, it was kind of like almost like a Tusk moment, like Fleetwood Mac. Like we did spend so much time recording. Then we went to Electric Lady and mixed with this guy, Michael Brower, who's a champion. That. And it was like, life-changing experience of that so we've had some amazing that's a great sounding record though. yeah thank you that I've was been really <laughs> that was really fun to do and now this new one we've just been taking our time writing and, and recording. what do you kind of call the music you play because people always ask me i'm always, I was like oh yeah it's like coming like it's like you know came in they're like what kind of music is that i'm like how did i always describe it as kind of like rock. is that what they call it like it must have a name we have a lot of rock guitars like, and there's a lot of synths so i don't know yeah, because it's like it's very Brooklyn-y. Yeah, there's like a Tears for Fears vibe in there. Right, I always think here it is like early Pink Floyd meets the ba Beach Boys meets totally. something from the '80s. Yeah, and it's, yeah. it's been fun <laughs> doing so many records too. Like our musical things have changed. Like I feel like our first couple records were like Pink Floyd, Beach right. Boys. Then it's gone into more Tears for Fears, a little more poppy. Right. And then now on this one, we're getting I think back into the more weird. But you have some talented folks on stuff. Band. Yeah, I mean Matt. Yeah, Matt. Yeah, we've been friends since Sam. we were thirteen. Right, yeah. it's all these guys and Jeff. And best Jeff is a, yeah, amazing. And they've all been now lead singers in their own bands. Right, and then well, Sam could sing his ass off because Sam was in my band. Exactly, <laughs> Sam so could like, really sing. Matt sang in the Metropolitan Opera when he was a kid. Is that right? Yeah. So he's. Oh, see, I never been even knew singer. he sang. So why wasn't he the singer in the subjects? Because he's playing drums. 
Right. Because Dave, Dave is a singer. Right. But, but then I, towards the end of the subjects, then Matt started writing songs and I started singing together. That. Right. And then there was like that. I remember. That's right. I yeah. forgot about all that. And then there was that healthy he competition sing. of songs. And then, right. And, and then, then it morphed into Caveman. Yeah. That's right. I remember like all of a sudden I was like, wait, Matt sings? <laughs> yeah. The drummer? Is that, you know, is that voice? But he's a great drummer. He's a lefty drummer, isn't he? Yeah, lefty. That's why I That was always like the big issue. He's open. like super Phil, drunk sorry. trying to like... <laughs> Or Phil going, like, I don't want that guy touching my yeah, toes. He's hammered. Grab the hammer. <laughs> yeah. Grab the Everything got knocked over. Yeah, those Shanae Bar days were... Oh, my God. I've never seen a guy fall over that Because those times. were some <laughs> of the first subject shows, too. Well, we've already played a bunch, but, like, really being comfortable in a bar. Right. People not yelling at us. Because <laughs> it was, like, our first experience of, like, playing, really. Yeah. And you're like, oh, how the subjects in? They play some weird... Yeah, shit. they'll do anything. They don't yeah. give a shit. So we'd play some songs, and then we started doing a residency there also. So we both had the residencies there. You know, that was one of those magical moments in time, too. It was you know, where space, like me and Jeff were talking about. It. It's like a magnet. That space yeah, that just so happened. many people. Because Jeff, didn't Jeff work there? Jeff worked there. Yeah, I think Jeff. Robert James, because they lived across the street. Oh, that's and right. Robert they James lived there, right. was there. And Mike Whitty was like, you need to know Jeff. He plays an elephant. Right. And he had this big mustache. Yeah. He was about to go on tour. Yeah. And, became, and him and Robert James were roommates. I think he was booking us. Like, because yeah. the Sinead Bar thing started. We started that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we rehearsed upstairs. Exactly. Because we had the room with Molly. Like, and we would go downstairs and have a drink. In like, let's play. And what's her name? Faye would be yeah, yeah. bartending. There'd be no one in the place. Yeah. So we're like, why don't we just go get our stuff and we'll play in here? Yeah. She'd be like, that'd be cool. At least there's someone to hang out yep. with. And that's how that whole thing started. And it's turned into a whole thing where like yeah. other bands were starting. Like, we would say, hey, you know, come and play. Yeah. It's like a half my band and half your band yeah. and you're playing together. Exactly. And there aren't that many situations. You play slide like that. with us a bunch. Yeah. yeah like there fun. aren't that many times where you get to play with your friends and just and we're playing there's one no night. Pressure. Greg Garing was there. Yeah, yeah. And then all these cats. Remember the guys that great band with the mustaches. Remember what during your, your mustache period when yes. you were like you couldn't grow a mustache? Who were those like, guys? Yeah, those guys have mustaches. But we saw, I saw them open for like the drive-by truckers. They were really good, and then all of a sudden you knew them because they had mustaches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we called them the mustache they band, but they were in, really good. They played, I saw them playing at the Annex, which was down right. the street. But they were really good. Yeah, they and they came great. down and played one night. The guitar player was like Paul Kossoff. Yeah, some and shit. the singer was really good. Yeah, they sounded yeah. like there was a great band. And then they everyone was just coming there to hang out, and we'd we'd start at like eleven or. 12 at night. Yeah. Leave there, it was light out. <laughs> yeah. Didn't <laughs> be like, oh shit, I gotta go home. Like, I remember our good friend Sharon Van Netten, who's huge now, doing amazing stuff. She was playing there when she was really yeah, young. Cock Lords would come. Yeah, just like, like a bunch of. Craig and all his friends. Like, yeah. it was just like, you know, like Witty would be like, he was Walking doing Jaeger bombs. Yeah, well, that was the bomb Jaeger playing. bomb period. Oh, yeah, yeah. Remember, we would do a raffle? I always <laughs> want You would every time. I have pictures of that. We would spam. raffle off spam. Like, anything we could find cheap, we'd like, raffle it off. It was like, I why happened to Cobra wins every time? It was like, it's the only person who will actually eat spam <laughs> out of a can. Because he like, has a lid. Yeah. <laughs> you had a whole second beak where you're like, dude, it's pretty good. It's like, <laughs> I can drink uh, more. Yeah, you're like, that's not really good. But but those were just fun times. Yeah. You know, like, but that's, all, you know, like part of this whole thing. You know, if you're playing music, making guitars, you know, like, that's how these things happen. Yeah. You know, like. I mean, Jeff became our best friend. Then he was in the band. Well, Robert, then he was working at 30th Street with us. And I, we got on the job at 30th Street. <laughs> yeah, your whole band whole worked band. there. Yeah, Pickles would work there once on security. <laughs> that's. He was just sitting I was like, what is he doing? Because a bunch of guitars got stolen. Yeah, so that's that, right. Pickles was, like, was we security. We need someone for security. Pickles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jeff worked there. Sam worked there, of yeah. course. You know, like, it was great. And then Sam was in my band. Yeah. You know, so like that you know, ended my band, that one lineup of my band, because Sam went on tour with you guys. Yeah, yeah. And that was that, which was kind of cool, because I was just getting Mountain Cat going. And yeah. I was going back into the city to play all the time. And I was like, was like I was kind of psyched to take a break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so that kind of worked out. I was like, oh, there's, you know, do some stuff, yeah. and then Sam will come back. And you guys never came back. No. <laughs> we got, like, we're years. Gone. <laughs> I was like, gone. oh, I guess he's not coming back. Yeah, like, Just Shanae keep Bar. seeing more tour dates. Yeah, you know? it's like, oh, still going. Yeah, like, Shanae Bar and Chelsea Guitars were very similar in that. Of, like, those were big and small spots that... Well, I think the guy who owned Shanae Bar didn't even know anyone was doing that. Nope, didn't I care I think he just also. found out that there was money in the cash register. Yeah, and he was like, exactly. whatever, yeah. just do that. Do whatever you want. You know, like, so it was yeah, just one Shane, of those magical plays. Shane was the owner. Yeah, I never met him. You know, like... Didn't Phil know him because he would get liquor from I him so. or something? But, yeah, it was just like one of those magical moments in time, you know, where, you know, you're going there. It all lined I think up. we did it once a week. Yeah, once a week. You'd never do that. Yeah, we'd just go down there and play, and whoever yeah. shows up is playing. 
you know, like, always someone is around. Yeah, I remember Mike Witty like walking across the bar playing, <laughs> and he just fell off. Yeah, we're like, he's there and he's gone. He's gone. We're like, oh, but behind the other end, fell, <laughs> the register <laughs> side. <fell> off. <laughs> It's like you don't Still do that. Playing, though. Yeah, you're, you're just like don't... down by the river, just the E. Yeah, I remember he used to do the bow and arrow. <laughs> oh, he would like pull the E string and force it go and let it go. And oh then my! God. And all the like glasses would shake. That, that's the first time I've ever learned about flat wound bass strings with him because you just <laughs> yeah, he bam. never tuned his bass ever. No. He's like tuning it's why like wrestling ropes. He had the big thick ones. <laughs> I just didn't tune it. It was fine. Yeah. it's still in tune. It's in my yeah, house. You now. bend it. Yeah. <laughs> I never tune that thing. Yeah. Yeah, he but, threw it across a bar once. We were playing up here at Nyack. Yeah. And, like the crowd just dumped everything and <laughs> hit the back wall. <laughs> it was fine. Yeah, it's like, but that's the thing where I am taking my guitars of vintage guitars of that. They last and they're built well. Right. So yeah, that thing he but threw. But you also them. know, as a musician, their tr instruments don't always get treated great. They'll fall. Right. Well, that's what we always were attracted to those ones that they're were really so messed up. You yeah. got me into that. Like just. Yo, you love the like the, the remember the SG I had that was in a fire. Yeah, the was six, Les Paul that was in a fire. Yeah, yeah that oh, that's one. right. There was an SG also. The, the white SG I got. It was right. Like a well, Dan collected five. guitars that were in fire. Yeah. <laughs> Dan collected I had that the weirdest thing. Junior that had a broken heel and a broken headstock. That sounded amazing. That one was. That's fun. right. Yeah, those broken guitars always sound better. Yeah. Danny has a sixty that, Junior with a broken headstock. Sounds amazing. Oh man, remember his Strat with the broken headstock oh, yeah, all the way, yeah. and then Chris Trainer was like. Hey, can you age the strap for me? I was like, sure. And I put the headstock through my bandsaw oh. <laughs> and glued it all back together. Oh, yeah. And he's like, dude, what the fuck? I was like, it's like Danny's 74 Dang. strat. Like, it's, it'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's stronger. But I just cut it down the side. I was like, don't worry about it. Yes, that was the one thing, too. You were always fearless about just doing that. Like, oh, I'll fix that. I'll just... Put some stuff here, and I'll nail some shit in there, yeah, and it'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, part of that's part of that thing is you have to be willing to go there. Yeah, you know, like a lot of times it's like not. precious. It's like which is cool, but it's also art. You gotta get weird a little bit. So um, let's talk about the guitar shop. Yeah. So now with the shop, we've been around since 2015 now. Wow, that's amazing. which is crazy. So, yeah, it's so, yeah. So we went. So it was Cobra Guitars, and I met Eric and Moss there, uh, and then became brothers with Eric and Moss, of course. But then, a couple months into me and Eric's friendship, we realized he married my second cousin. Really? Yeah. So we're our, like. So the, you're related. We're kind of related <laughs> in a weird, fucked up way. Wow. Kirk Yano introduced me to to Eric. And how long did it take you to realize that you? A couple months. We were just talking about some family stuff. He's like, "Oh, that's funny. I know a JoJo." You know, from Harlem. That's my wife's uncle. I was like, what? What? Yeah. So that happened. So then we were just instantly <laughs> we're like, all right, well, now we're fucked because now we're stuck together forever. Oh, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. So I didn't then, know that. Yeah. So then we always talked about doing a shop. Oh, then we went into Robert James' shop and we were there three years and then needed the space upstairs. So he's like, I've got a shop on Atlantic Avenue. You can go there. So when we had the whole basement, it was like the biggest shop ever. So unhealthy. <laughs> Basement <laughs> shop. Yeah. No we're, ventilation we're whatsoever. <laughs> sanding, we're doing the whole thing. And then we were there six months and his shop closed there because it just wasn't a good space for it. Right. Um, and then I found on Craigslist the new shop. Uh, and then that's where we're at now is the guitar shop. So and you're myself. consigning guitars, you're doing everything. Yeah, we right? have a whole floor. You have like a legit guitar shop. Yeah, besides yeah. It's where you build these. It's yeah, like yeah. We have, building. A, we have a guitar shop in the back, like a wood shop in the back. And then the middle room is, well, you walk in. Kind of like a showroom. Yeah, I've been there. You just didn't have the whole floor yet. Yeah. And now the middle room, we have tons of guitars on the walls. And right. we try to have like cheaper stuff, like cool, like Mexican Swire stuff. You, right. we Great. Do the, we'll do the frets on it. Yeah. We'll make it, we'll put it in the work. But then you have like a $350 guitar you can sell to somebody right. that... It's yeah. just shit to have. Right. But then we have the, you know, we have Michael Tobias' stuff. We have a Rick Turner base. You're like, doing Earthquake Refect. We got all the Earthquaker stuff. They made me a couple amps for Caveman. That's right. Which is awesome. Yeah, and that's kind of like the way guitar shops are supposed to be. Yeah. Like, it's just, just cool little spots. But n nowadays, if you want to open a guitar shop, like you guys are in a cool area of Brooklyn. You found a place you could afford. Yeah. And you don't have to say, you know, like give lessons and do yeah. all the shit you don't want to do just to make enough money to pay the rent to do the things totally. you do want to do. Yeah, we've you know? been very lucky with that. Like we'll put on shows in the shop. Right. Earthquaker will come do or whatever. We'll have... Uh, 
you know. Because you have a cool little scene. Like, you couldn't do that in Manhattan. Yeah. Because your space would be $30,000. Exactly. So, you know, you can't just be doing exactly. cool shit. You know, you have to be like, too, what can we make $30,000 like, doing? We're in Sunset Park, and the way our space is set, it's like it, the space found us. It's like there was a wood right. shop in there already. Right. And then there's no neighbors right around us. So we can, I can work all night and not have anybody right. say That's that magical or, flow of things. Yeah. You know, like, but like once you works. tap into that, you know, totally. things. Totally. That, that was my thing when I opened Mountain Cat. Like, it was all, like, a thing of, like, I just didn't want to live in the city anymore. I didn't want to work in a guitar shop anymore. And I was like, well, what am I going to do then? Yeah. And then one day I had the idea of like, well, why don't I just get out of the city? Because anything I'm going to do here is going to be too expensive anyway. And I'll just do what I do privately and see if I could do it. Yeah. You know, just That's find the whole thing. It's like, let me see if you have right, the balls so to do it. Right. Or just try something new. Because the business was changing anyway. I didn't see a future in guitar shops. Mm -hmm. You know, I just didn't see that being a future. Yeah. You just with the markups getting smaller and smaller and people buying their strings online. Totally. You're like, you can't pay for all this. And that's where we got really lucky with the guitar shop, too, with being with LaBella and, like, Eric's the right. best. And so now we have the strings basically factory pricing at the shop. Right. So it's like, if you want to come visit or you want to come get strings, you come to the shop and we have everything that they make on the wall. Right. Like, from loot strings to the right. biggest flat wounds. Well, I want to, to have Eric on the podcast. Sitar. I think he's in Germany right now or yeah, something. Yeah. But he's the next podcast I want to do. Yeah. Because it's he's funny been doing it since he was a kid. Yeah, and his family's been doing it for hundreds of years. Yeah. But he invited me up to Newburgh to see LaBella strings, and I went with my friend Travis. It's awesome. And to see how a guitar string is made. I got to make one. Yeah, it's like, awesome. It's this crazy process, and like they're handmade. Yeah, like holy shit. So like th that'll be a really interesting podcast because people don't think about guitar strings much. They no, just put well, them on their guitars. They're so disposable. Yeah, it's just a thing, but they but, don't think much about how it's put together. Or, you totally. know, and that's what I'm lucky, too, of like, all right, I can make a weird gauge. I can get an extra. Right. I can get a 60 for this. Right. And, and then you start like, thinking in terms of that. Yeah. You know, it's like, like, oh, we can do weird stuff. Like, he made me that custom set. It was like, I want flat ones, but I want them a little brighter right. and warmer at the same time. Right. So he made me a set of steel core brass wrapped flat wounds. Right. But cool. That's like an amazing thing. Yeah. So we're very lucky with that of having that, and also having their tradition of hundreds of years and yeah. their reputation. Now we yeah, I went and just shop. like looked up stuff about him as I was thinking about doing a podcast. I'm like, geez, like his family's been doing this for hundreds of years. They started like in like a church. Yeah. yeah. You know, like because they were sheep nearby. <laughs> you know, you needed sheep. Yeah. You're like, that's fucked up. Yeah. You know, like so like that's gonna be a it was really a certain interesting diet, and in only in this corner in Italy that they right. had it. Like, you know, like that's gonna be a really interesting. Pod that's why yeah. I think the podcasts are really cool because then I was talking to Jeff Silver who d does Just Car Frets and mm -hmm. Just Car Frets is right near here. Oh, nice. Well, they're made in Germany, yeah, yeah, yeah. but they're sold near here. And I was like, oh, I should have you on the podcast because I don't even know much about frets, really. Yeah. You know, I know what they are, but I don't, you know, I know there's all these you different the kinds purpose. and I yeah. just always get the same ones. Yeah, yeah. You know, but there's, you know, that's stainless steel and I went into that a bit with my friend Alex. Because I don't, you know, some people love stainless steel frets, some people hate them. Well, it fucks up your tools. Well, then Alex said it doesn't. So yeah. Like, so, and then some people say it um, makes your guitar sound shitty. <laughs> and he well, was like, no, brighter. it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's probably a lot of different kinds of stainless steel frets. Maybe some do fuck up your tools. 80, some there's don't. also, you can get 80 20. Right. So and I don't different. know the answers to any of this, but yeah. I'm sure Jeff will tell us all the answers. Totally. So that's really valuable. Like, imagine like the next two podcasts, so you have those two guys, the guy who makes strings, the guy who makes frets. And then a lot of guys who make guitars. Yeah. And then a lot of guys who make amps. Then you're like, I'm like, oh, this pod, it's like anything else. Because we decided to make a podcast just because I like podcasts. And I looked for podcasts on guitars. I didn't really see any that do really guitar build. There's lots of guitar things, mm -hmm. but not really like really what I do, which is guitar builders. Yeah. Like most of my friends are guitar builders or amp builders. Or well, you've always been great with that of like showcasing guitar builders where there hasn't ever been always a place. Right. For well, it. they. It's an odd thing because it's not like I could buy this guitar from you for X amount of dollars, bring it back to my shop tomorrow and sell, and sell it, it for X amount of dollars. No. It doesn't work that way. No, no, no. That's why people come and go as dealers because I could buy it's this not. for you at a, with a decent markup and it seems, oh, great. I'll buy 10 of them. I'll make all this money. But you're not going to sell them. No. It's not the way it works unless you have a clientele for them. Exactly. And you know how to present them. And they don't flip that way. Someone has to believe in this guitar. Yeah. You know, I'm sure this isn't a cheap guitar. No. You, know, you hand make this. Yeah. It can't be cheap. You have to make money to live. So it's a thing where, like, you know, like people have come and go so many times in my, you know, have I've been doing this for nine years. Yeah. I've seen so many dealers get in 
with tons of money because you could buy these with you know a decent markup. Yeah. So I'm just like, oh, this will be easy. I'll buy these guitars. Then you have a and then bunch. I'll put them on the internet and they'll sell. And I just have to get some kids to ship them out. And I'm gonna make all this money. And it, it's not the way the business works. Yeah. You have to, you know, I, when I take on a new builder, I don't do it that much anymore. And you were a, a friend before all this. Yeah, yeah. But like, if someone were to call me now, I'm not looking to take on new builders. But I'll always take on something if it's really right. If you're into it. If it really fits yeah, right, it yeah. doesn't, I don't have two guitars in that sort of class or that something that would be totally. the same type of thing. So like, I tell you like this thing happened with Black Bolt amps mm -hmm. in Those LA. You have to check this out. Yeah. But I just happened to see it like in an ad or something. I saw it on the internet and I was like, wow, that's a really cool amp. And that's right up your alley with the and girl cloth. it was in the... LA. Yeah. So I called Chris Trainer and I was like, you know, cause he knows everybody. So I was like, Hey Chris, you know, you know anything about these black vault dance? He's like, that's so weird. I was at the guy's house yesterday. <laughs> he's like, I bought one. <laughs> he's like, I don't buy stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's like, he's like, they're awesome. Here's his phone number. Call. That's awesome. <laughs> and he was just super cool. And he's yeah. doing the same thing you're doing. You know, he's a one man shop. Really into everything's reclaimed. You know, and you can see he's running the thing through giant machines. You know, he's making these cabinets. Yeah, yeah. Each cabinet's a little different. I just got one with an oak cabinet. Cool. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, it's so just like a cool guy doing his thing. Yeah. You know, like, and his amps are just really cool. And, yeah, and they, sound, they sound like that. Yeah. They, every amp has a total personality. And that's, and that's also, f like, great and can be a downfall as a small builder because then it's like, oh, I want that. It's like, all right, well, that is gone right this is this but if you plugged in and say this same. guitar which really has a sound into one of those amps or a satellite amp like a satellite really has a sound totally you which know? is the best yeah a satellite amp to me just makes you plug your guitar into it and it makes your guitar sound exactly the way it's supposed to sound yep. <laughs> just, open just nice. no bullshit yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just your guitar in your face yep. like there's nothing in between this and your ears exactly you know like there's just couldn't you open up those amps there's just no bullshit yeah, in yeah. there i even know what those parts are <laughs> you know like, totally you know like oh that's a capacitor yeah, i know that there's just better. no crap in there there's only two knobs yeah. you know and there's just and that's the way to do it you know build the stuff really well yeah. at a really hot but not you know, anytime I see an amp with lots of knobs, I'm not into it. You know, like, they have that sound. It turns into the Marshall JC... Those things, right. 2000, where it's, yeah. like, three rows of knobs. And then knobs. there's, like, things on the back to <laughs> flip. I can't even get those things to operate. Yeah, like, no, you know, like you. You know, like, a Fender amp has too many knobs for me. Yeah. It's like, six. Yeah, I'm good yeah. with two. I don't like when Fender has a mid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, just give me the treble and the bass. Yeah, like, you know, like, Johnny Winter, would just put everything on ten. Yeah. <laughs> This would be fine. Like yeah. he'd hit the first note, and girls would be running right. up the aisles. Yeah. Like, ah! <laughs> He's like, bright switch. Sounds up. good. Yeah. That's nice. Like Silver Face tonight. twins and a Firebird. <laughs> <laughs> but he was like, yeah, it sounds good. Yeah, it sounds good to me. <laughs> but you know, like, but you know, that's the thing. Like when you like when you buy all fifties tweeds, they sound like that. Like they sound like a satellite or, or a black yeah, ball because yeah. they're made the same way. Exactly. And then the more stuff you've said, like you know, these guitars are made you know, by hand, and they're well thought out. And, the, you know, like, you couldn't get a wood like this to build 40,000 of these. You know, oh, like, totally. you know, you can't do it that I way. Add one piece, and you can't I've shoot this finish this. right. Yeah, you, it just can't. That's why each one of these guitars has a personality. And then we'll play all these when we're done doing this, yeah. and Daniel will put them into the video. But when you hear these, and we're just gonna play them through like a straight up Fender amp, there's yeah. no bullshit. But you can even playing them acoustically, you know what these are gonna sound like. Yeah. Right? And this we haven't even talked about. It's staring me right in the face the entire mm -hmm. time. Is a lap steel you built? Yeah, I just started doing lap steels not that long ago. This is one I made. For my good friend Dan Aid. Um, started doing lap steels and always thought it'd be fun to do one piece of wood and hollow out the neck. Right, that's like a Weissen board thing, right? Exactly. And <coughs> I actually found that out like as I was doing it, like, oh, I just thought this would be nice to oh, really? hollow it out a little <laughs> and bit. And everyone's like, that's like, a Weissen board thing. Yeah, I was like, oh, cool, <laughs> I should look at that. Well, he probably came up with the same idea. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, like, it was probably like, oh, well, it would be cool if this was hollowed out. Yeah, Why well, can, can they do the, that to a guitar or they can't? No, because since like it's rod square, rod? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can do channels, but since it's square, it's not going to fold up and you don't need to put a truss right. rod. Yeah, because uh, it just action. struck me, right? Like, if, if they do this to a guitar, a steel and it sounds really good, why wouldn't you do it to a guitar? Yeah, I mean, I guess you can put some chambers, but you kind of want it to be as strong it as possible. possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but this could just be a giant thing. Totally. Matter. And I've always done more hollow bodies than not, so I was like, I gotta do a hollow body or a hollow neck. Hollow what would happen something. if you hollowed out the body? 
But it'd be cool, or it'd be cool, it'd be fun, more acoustic, maybe. Yeah, yeah, might sound like. Shit. And what what is this? This is white oak. Wow. That I got from Jeff's friend on tour, who had an art studio, and this was like some scrap that he did a big project on. So it's like I've been finding wood on tour, like, which is been You use great. a lot of odd woods, like. Yeah. But you wouldn't have no idea what it would sound like before you. Nope, not at all. Do, so do you ever build something out of a piece of wood like that and it just sounds terrible? I haven't yet. Right, so all wood could sound. Yeah, it just has its own personality. Well, so this like is one, they'll make you like a about. prototype and they just use cheap wood like plop, poplar or something like that. It sounds like, amazing. Sounds <laughs> we just did a, because uh, in the guitar shop we're also doing the Labella basses, right. uh, the Alintos. So Moss is making them and we also have this guy Isaac in the shop who has been apprenticing with us since he was 15. And then he went to Cooper Union. He's a smart motherfucker. He's great. He actually drew my logo. Oh, is that right? He's an amazing artist. That's a good logo. Yeah, he's awesome. And uh, then he graduated college and has been working with us now. So it's awesome having him. So we've been doing the Olinto bass, and we just did a Poplar bass. It's like old P bass vibe, right. and it's great. And it's I know. like doing balsa wood things. Yeah, they like, sound they good. They sound great. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole thing. Like Everyone says, oh, it has to be this and that, but then you play like these Mexican bass. The guy would, like a Japanese tell you, it's basswood. Yeah. It sounds amazing. Sounds like I never knew it was basswood. Yeah, yeah. I just thought it was whatever you're supposed to make a tell you out of. There's... There's rules and there's not. It's just like there's things. Right, that's what you start to realize. That's why when you say, you know, it comes up in every podcast, you talk about PAFs. Yeah. You know, like this magical thing, which they really are magic, but it's just at the time of. But they can't quite figure out why it's magic. Because like, they're hand wound and they're each different. Right, like, yeah. but was, I always think maybe it's like. The materials. That it was, because you can just take one apart and figure out exactly how they made it, but PAFs do do this certain thing, so maybe the. Some of the part of the magnetic, all the stuff that went into the Al Nico or whatever, maybe that was different back then. Totally. That mine was different. Absolutely. And whatever it is lent and the itself wire, to this. The copper. Right. Different. It lent itself to this sound. Because you get new humbuckers. And so a lot of them, like Danny at Chelsea, I always thought, it's like, I would, I never really had PAF guitars because yeah. I didn't have the money yet back then. And I would get like whatever new pickup was hot. And I'd be like, oh, these sound just like PAFs. And Danny would be like, no, they don't. Yeah. They're good sound pickups. Yeah. But, but they're they not don't PAFs. sound like PAFs. And I'd be like, well, he's just saying that because he has PAFs, and I don't. But it, yeah, but it's true. He knew what they sounded like. They're like that hollow thing. They too. do this weird thing. It's very hard to describe. Yeah, but like I, more air around it. Yeah, when you, the neck pickup and the bridge pickup, I always say when you when you go to the neck pickup, it just sounds like the bridge pickup just went. Yep. But it sounds the same. It sounds the same. They're bright in yeah. a good way. No, they're but really not they're bright. Bright, but like, they're. Well, Jimmy Page, when you know, like he'd be playing, it would sound like a Telecaster. Yeah. And then he'd switch. But when he was on that bridge pickup, it was bright as hell. Yeah, bright as hell. Yeah, and then when you switch to the. And the other thing you always realize is, you know, on newer Les Pauls, you always, I always used to just use the bridge pick. I never used the neck pickup ever. Yeah, it was because fucking it was unusable. The carpet on it top of terrible, it. It's terrible, right? <laughs> you can just take it out and throw it away. Yeah. But you'll look at, at the guys in the 60s, like Paul Kossoff, they're always on the neck pickup. Yeah, always, because then it's bright. Right, and then you would hear if they went to the bridge pickup, because suddenly it would be like, like a telecaster yeah. got stuck in there. Yeah. Like, and the new pickups aren't like yeah. that. You know, like, and then you do, fun, you know, there's so many great pickup makers now. Mm -hmm. You know, like, and some of them, Kind of, the thing I you were we were in, hip to that like at Chelsea was finding early T tops. Yeah, absolutely. Sound like PA. They do that PAF thing where you switch back and forth. They're a little growly. That's what I had on my three thirty five. And it's like, oh, I finally got. I think you put them in one of my yeah, yeah. So, and your that. thing was always taking the covers off the the neck, the neck pickup, yeah, which really a is a great brighter. move. I did that on my three three five. Yeah, I have so many guitars, and you, I think you did it back yeah, yeah. then. <laughs> it's like, oh, take the cover. You get off. a T top, rip the cover off, and put it in the neck, and it sounded amazing. Yeah, sound like a PAF. Sounds because it came right after the PAI. Yeah, yeah. It just they're just a little barkier sounding. And then yeah, it's just like it had that has that thing that where you switch between because I have a '68 custom, and it just has that thing. Those when you switch between the pickups and it sounds amazing. Yeah, like everywhere. But it's more the neck pickup you want to be on. Yeah. And like the modern guitars, you, the neck pickup was so dark. Mm -hmm. It was like unusable, like on an R9, any of those things with the burst buckets. Yeah, it's also the paint too of how it's like just plastic. Right. Now. Well, that's a thing. Like when we do these makeovers for people, and you want to like it really open. They want to change the pickups and this, and I was like, I wouldn't change anything. I would just change the first, paint and then see what it sounds like. Yeah. You know, and then change it. But if you change it all, oh, you're not going to know what changed. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you want one step at a time. Yeah. So when you when you strip these things and you it's shoot already them, a huge difference. Huge. Yeah. You know, when you're letting the wood suddenly breathe. You know, like, and then you, you change the pickups. But the burst buckers, I found, like, like, they're just not. They don't sound good clean. 
No, they're fine dirty. If they, you play heavy music, I think they're fine. But and maybe they, that's what they're voiced they're, for. Yeah. You know, but if you play real, like, like I play wacky. really clean, they, they, they're they lacking character. Yeah. They're lacking kind of everything. Mm -hmm. So I would take them and get rid of them, and then we were buying pickups from there were so many guys to buy. Oh, them they, now then. there's. We tried them all back then, yeah. and they were all. I don't remember ever getting a set and putting them in and thinking they sucked. Yeah, I remember we got set on Lawlers because those are great. Yeah, well, I was the first Lawler dealer. Yeah, I remember. You know, at Thirty Street. And yeah, I remember that, and that's how I ended up putting them into my guitars. Right. And then when Moss was like, "Dude, just make your own pickups," and they're like, "Wait a minute, yeah." So I remember calling Lawler to become. I did, I bought a set somewhere. I bought it from them, I guess. And I, I put them in a guitar, it's when we were working at 30th Street, and I loved them. And I talked to Matt, and I was like, let's deal these pickups. He's yeah. like, fine, go call them up and get it done. And I called them up, and they were like, oh, we don't do dealers. Yeah. And I was like, what? You know, and I was like, you know, I have this you know, great guitar store in New York City, big guitar store. You know, we do a lot of installs. You know, we could probably sell a lot of your pickups. And they, they're like, let us think about it. And they got back to me, and they're like, all right, you know, we could do it, but... You, know, you you can't sell online. We we want that. And I was yeah. like, that's fine. I was like, we have this pop in store. Yeah, yeah. And we was, were selling so many lollers. I was putting him in on everything. Yeah, everyone who asked was yeah. like, get these. We was, we sold so many lollers. They would come to New York and take us out to dinner. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, but we were the first loller dealer, and those were super pickups, and they were really consistent. Yeah. You know, like, that was the thing about them. They were very consistent. And they would ship them on time. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a big problem in our business. Yeah. You know, like time is what? Because a lot of the really good guys just aren't timely. No. You know, so it becomes like a whole thing. Doesn't go you know. hand in hand. No, that's why you have to, like, when people are going to order, like, a custom guitar, you have to prepare them for this. Like, yeah. all right, it's six months, but. Could be seven or eight. Seven and eight's not even bad. You know, it's yeah. like, but things could go wrong. Think of the amount of things that can go wrong in building oh, this guitar. You get the you get the neck done, and then all of a sudden the truss rod doesn't work. Right. That happened to me before. Right. Like, you start turning it, and then it's like, well, oh, fuck, it doesn't work. Got to take the fingerboard right. off. Or Imagine save that. As much How as long does that take? You yeah, the finish. A million things could go wrong. Yeah. Oh, oh, especially shooting lacquer. It's yeah. Like the, that's if why the people, weather. If the weather is not right. Right. You can't paint. Right, and that's what people don't realize. You know, that's why you can. That's why Gibson does what it does. You know, or a big company because mm -hmm. they simply have to. Yeah. You know, I always said they can't make. You can't make 40,000 of these this way. And it'll be exactly the same each one. And they don't have a flaw. Yeah. Where you could ship it to a shop and it's a brand new guitar with not a single totally. flaw in it. Like if this guitar gets cold, it will weather check. Yeah. You know, like. Exactly. It's probably doing it right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's cold in here. In yeah, but you know, that's what people don't realize when you get involved in these things. Because people, you know, people play stores where you, how long, you know, you must have been late on guitars at points, you know, like. That's why you try to work with people who understand what they're getting involved in. Like someone's making you a guitar exactly. for a piece of wood. Yeah. Well, some sometimes even people don't think that deeply into like, oh, I have that option or, of. Right. But yeah, we've been lucky of like finding the right people who get it. Right. You have to get yeah. Cause some people you could tell they don't. You know, like. They it's like you want to buy a Gibson because you want it perfect and, and you, you want, want it today. It, yeah. You know, like which is fine. You know, yeah, absolutely. Then I also have that thing too. It's like in the middle of a build. It's like, all right, we have a month tour. <laughs> right. I gotta go. And what luckily, happened? my customers are my, you know, people who've been around of who get it. Well, you seem to deal with a lot of people you know. Yeah. You know, or people who know people you know. Totally. So they know what they're getting involved. Yeah, and that's also part of the attraction of it. Is like I am a touring professional musician. Right. That's well, that's the where it's part different, of it. but that's that was a big problem with Cobra Guitars. Yeah. It's really bright as Cobra Guitars was really starting to kick. Your band went on tour for three years. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. And that was, okay, what do you do with that then? Yeah. But, if you, but you are buying, right, because a lot of guys probably don't play, you know, you, which is fine. You don't have to play yeah. guitar, you know, to build guitars. Totally. But, but to really, to go tour the world and play these things, yeah. you know what's required from a guitar to sound totally. good on a big stage. Like you can make yeah. a guitar for Chris Trainer, who's exactly. gonna go play on a big stage to yeah. a big rig. Yeah, and then he's got the 335 that it's also an extra thick top, so it's right. not gonna feed back. Right, because he's volume. gonna go play it in a gigantic place. Yeah. You know, he's not playing in his house. You know, totally. he's playing in an arena. Yeah. So that's a different thing. You've played in an arena. So you know what the guitar needs to do. Yeah. And it's like I've also toured with my old D'Angelico and my 335, and right. it's like you sit it wrong, it's gonna be fucked up. Right. Well, that's even what Night Bob was saying when he was on tour with Aerosmith was like, you know, one of the things about being on tour with a band like that is you get to play through their stuff, and you get to see playing in an arena it's different. is different. 
he, 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 he said it's like body surfing. heavy guitar. Right. He played yeah. heavy Telecaster. The yeah. exact opposite of what everyone told you. I want a really he, light Telecaster. He would no. say, oh, find the heaviest Tele you <laughs> yeah. could find because the thin ones disappear when yeah. you play with a band. In the mix. Yeah, it's gone. And he would have 50s Tele's that were really heavy. Everyone thinks they don't exist. Yeah. They do. Not exactly. okay. They weren't all light. No, they were just light ones, wood yeah. was available, but he would look for the heavy ones. Because he said when you play with a big band, the light ones disappear. Mm -hmm. But they sound good in your house. And that's why most of my even hollow bodies have some weight to it. Right, yeah, they have to have solid. some weight. That's why everyone wanted doing... things so light. Everything like, there was a period of R9s where they had to be 8.1, yeah. 7 chambered, So it's not even a Les Paul. But then they started weight relieving. Yeah. Even. That's not even chambered. Yeah, they just exactly. popping some holes out of it. Yeah. And those didn't sound, No. they don't sound terrible, but they don't sound right. But There's it's something not what missing it is. in the yeah. mid section. Some wood. <laughs> right, and then when the Les Pauls got really heavy in the 70s, they would say they sustained better. Mm -hmm. You know, they, but they, those they probably are the bad did. Ones. <laughs> you know, well, then they start playing, making them out of maple. But, yeah, yeah. You know, but they don't sound bad necessarily. You can get like a 73 no, no, great, custom but that's like great, that, like but it's down. too heavy to stand yeah. up with. You know, but they could sound good. So there's that, that thing, like, too light a guitar just would well, sound good in your house. You know, but yeah. it just it, it doesn't sound good with a band. Totally. But that's why, since you're actually out playing these things, and you're going to make them for somebody who's out playing, yeah. it's a different thing than somebody who's going to put it on a stand and look at it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with that. And that's you know, where like, I've like changed my neck a bunch too, where I've gone just for the neck, like one inch, like on the neck joint, I have it really in because I use a one inch neck. Right. Yeah. Look at that. And then I carve it up, and then my headstock. I don't want to use any. Uh, string trees or anything. So my headstock is sitting further back, yeah. even though it's flat. Yeah, that's so, interesting, look at that. So, like, even on these, like how... Well, that's smart, yeah, because the string tree thing becomes a big issue. It's another tuning Guitars obstacle. need string trees. Yeah. yeah like, this, so, the nuts, got, it's gotta go So I put down. enough tension on it, because I have it sitting back. I'm using right. a big piece of wood, and I'm carving it down. So that right. a See, that's thing. a lot of work, though. Yeah, you just trial and error of right. figuring that but out. But that's very smart, because you don't need a string tree, because they're going at an angle now. Exactly. I and just had a big problem with And it's also guitar. flat, so right. when you drop it, like a fender, so your headstock's not going to break. Right. That's I've very never smart. had one break. Yeah, just... No one's ever broke one of these? No. That's smart. I mean, I've never seen a fender guitar with a broken headstock, except once or twice. Yeah. I don't know how they did it. you got to throw you it. you got to do something wrong. Yeah. But like, yeah, I mean, you could drop a fender; it's not going to break the head. Yeah, because like, it's, it's Pete Townsend flat. never got a broken headstock from those strats. Yeah, the neck, the would, neck never, broke. <laughs> would rip out of the screws, yeah. but the headstock's never broke. Yeah, it's just not what happened. So that's what I did with this one. So it's kind of like in the middle of Gibson and Fender. Why do you not like the string trees? You just don't. Not, not even that I don't like them, but also I guess I just don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that it comes They're down just to fucked up. Yeah, well, it's just it's <laughs> another point for your stuff to get. Right, it's a big problem. And if you don't have, yeah, I had this with a guitar, and like you, you, the customer didn't want the string tree because they didn't want the, but the string would not. It wouldn't sit in the nut. So that's why, yeah, I pulled it. And down. it was making this weird overtone. But if you just pushed here, it's fine. The overtone goes away. Exactly. So and the guy's like, but it won't be original if you put the string tree in. But like, but it's got this overtone we can't get rid of. Yeah. You know, so that is like a real flaw. Yeah. You know, some guitars it just is. This guitar just was making this weird overtone. Yeah. And we could, we tried everything. We're like, it's. And the second you do this, it's, it's gone. gone. Yeah, it's just because sitting in but the But it back. was like, you know, it was a Strat Plus or something. You know, it is a, you know, a semi-collectible guitar. Like, I didn't want an extra hole in the headstock. Yeah. It's good. You just didn't want it. Take so we deal with it. We, we dealt with it. I forget. We changed the nut like three yeah. or four times. Eventually we got it done. But it just, yeah, just, changed, put, just putting a string tree in it would have been done, done in five minutes. Yeah. So this is a very smart design. Yeah. So and then also just with tuning, since I use a Bigsby all the time right. with my That's playing. That's right. Your guitars almost all have Bigsby's. I only play with the Bigsby now. And caveman. Yeah, well, that's your thing. Ben. Yeah, I'll play I can't. Be, you know. So, but then in that sense of like, I always talk people into getting a big speed on well, their guitar. are really cool. The reason we didn't get them years ago they just is no one could set them up. Exactly. <laughs> and they went out to the same burp. I promise you, like, you play one of my guitars, and that's a big part of my building is like, you don't have to tune that much. You tune right. it. I barely tune in a show. Right. And it's just because it's a straight line. Right. There's no other things going on and it's just like laid But that's out. really because you're a touring musician you start to realize as a practical thing to you. Totally. You know, some people and then there's these stylish really too, in, that's like a thing. Yeah. But, but, but yeah, there's a practical. reason for it. So I, just, I think this looks cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know? it's totally. like, this, you know, and that is a big problem. You know, because really when you're touring or, or playing gigs, the most important thing is that your guitar stays in tune. 
Because you're going through different weather. You're going from California up to right. Portland. And if you don't have a super tech with you, you guys probably don't have a tech. No, you me. are the tech, yeah, right? Me. Fix so, everything. Right. You know. So you know, like unless you have like you know someone like Dave Rule there, you know, who could really work on your guitar every night. Yeah. You know, like these things have to hold up. Yeah. Even like that when we played a gig last night. You know, me and Mark. You know, it's like you know you, you want your shit to stay in tune. Yeah. You know, but you're playing a local bar or an arena. You know, it's. It's got. It just comes down to the sim. And some guitars do, and some guitars don't. Yeah. You know, mostly I find it's you know it strings get hung up in the nut. It's all in these two. In those two places, right? And we didn't know that when we were kids. We would get guitars and you would tune and you hear ping, 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 and we'd be like, "That's cool." But we didn't even know the pencil trick until later. You know how many people I told the pencil trick to at Chelsea, and they're like, "Oh my god, you changed my life." Yeah. Like, what changed my life when someone told it to me? Yeah. Because it gets rid of that clink, 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 and now your guitar will stay in tune. Yeah. It's just friction. Yeah. I mean, this you know you have a piece of metal rubbing against this yeah. it's gonna get burrs in it exactly and so they're gonna get burrs down there too yep so i used to break so many strings like before i started working at chelsea and i didn't realize they were all breaking the same oh, yeah place. my subject stays i was going through tons yeah, of strings. every gig i would break strings yeah you know and i thought it was just because i played hard i went yeah. to heavier i was playing 11s and i'd break strings like constantly i didn't realize my guitar just had crazy burrs yeah on the saddle and because i remember less going like where are they breaking i'm like oh if they, they break the saddle it's like just change bridge yeah it wasn't even into, into fixing. He's like, just put another bridge on, and I never broke another string. Yeah, just because. Wow. They're aluminum and little. It's a piece yeah. of metal rubbing against yeah. you. You're gonna get little sharp edges, hundreds right? Of pounds of pressure. It's an it's a natural thing, but no one knew how to do that years ago. Yeah. Uh, and I'd say this is never because we used to buy these guitars when we were kids. I'd all the good techs were on the road. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. If you were good, <laughs> you were working the for the Rolling Stones. Yeah, you, know? you were in the shop. <laughs> and the rest of the guys were just learning. So like, I had so many great guitars to just wouldn't stay in tune. We'd sell them. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, just like I, it had to stay it's in tune. I only had a few guitars, and I was playing gigs every night. Yeah, you couldn't have a guitar that couldn't go two or three songs, and we didn't have clip-on tuners. Yeah, yet. yeah. you know, like that. you would have to like unplug and tune. Yeah, you'd go to A. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it wasn't that bad, but we had tuners, but they weren't in line yet. Yeah, you had to pull it out of the amp and plug it into a tuner, like on stage. Yeah, like this sucks. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> a minute. Yeah, there's like people looking at you. Like, yeah. what's your problem? Like, oh, I'm saying tune. Yeah, it's not my fault. But that was also. How it went hand in hand with like our caveman sound with the band and having my guitar stay in tune was we would never stop. Oh, you just went song to song? We would go song to song, but then do an uh, instrumental interlude in the middle right. between. So it's just like. There's no chance to, right? <laughs> I'm just playing, so it's like it had to stay in tune. So I always worked really hard of like, all right, what's the best way possible? So then bringing the headstock back. Right, that's a really smart thing. And just having it a straight, no string trees. No, it's really smart. Yeah, on but any, that's even something. The sixth in line, like the high E, is still sitting pretty far back. Right. So it's fine. Like the tension is good. But do you find that bigger headstock sounds different? They look cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I love more mass on the headstock. That's because they used to say put Grovers on Martins and put Grovers on Les Pauls because yeah, it, it adds mass more weight to your headstock. Yeah, and it's a, definitely something like you can hear you play an old J forty five or something, and sometimes. Feel like you can hear it out of the headstock. Do you ever have that feeling? Yeah. Like what, you hear it out of that? the neck. Yeah. Right. You're like, wow, that's awesome. Because they were so resonant. Yeah. And they're big. Yeah. And yeah. like the old Gibson headstocks, like in the '40s, how they went really thin to thicker. Right. I've been even doing that, messing with that a little bit. Right. Too. Those like, I've been doing really thin doing. headstocks. You know, they really knew what they were doing. And so you pick up those old guitars. Yeah. And it sounds like the neck is. Well, yeah. You could feel it when you you strum it, and you feel it in your body. Yeah, you know, you feel it vibrating against you, but you feel it everywhere. You feel it in your hands and those guitars. It's just, you hit a G chord. And it's just, it's just beautiful. Yeah. and then you pick up but like you're a, in the neck. You really hear the neck. Yeah, even on an old Strad, we discovered this. Like, like, I got a couple. Like when I first opened Mountain Cat, I got like a 1960 Strat neck in trade for mm -hmm. a Banshee or something, and they were roughly the same value. I was like, cool. So I have this old slabboard neck, and. I didn't want it to sit without tension, so I just mm -hmm. threw it on a Protocaster body I had. And we strung it up, and it sounded just like a vintage guitar. So like, much is in oh, the neck. Oh, this sound's coming out of the neck. Yeah. And then Mark, my buddy who's <laughs> over there, bought that guitar. <laughs> you know, like, because it sounded just like a vintage guitar. Yeah. And then I got another old neck, a 58 Tele neck, and we slapped it on some body. We're like, whoa. Yeah, that's the only way you really learn these things. That's why Chelsea, you know, like we were always all doing that shit, shit around. Like that. There's right. always Danny had that box of necks in the back. Yeah, it was just a box of necks. <laughs> Vintage, <laughs> crazy real, fucking neck. Real shit though. Yeah, there was a bag of PAFs in there. You yeah. know, it's like you know, like so you could all the less 
explorers right. upstairs. You know, there's so much with. stuff to mess with. Like, I don't get nearly the amount of stuff that was yeah, left yeah. around Chelsea because it had been there for 20 years. And totally. They'd done so much stuff. It's Danny's but brain. That's, Danny had so much yeah. stuff. He was smart. He was. They were going to guitar shows. Years right. and just buying parts. Yeah. You know, Gretsch pickups or whatever, you know, so like we were always, you know, just making stuff out of stuff. Mm -hmm. Remember there was a point where we figured all well, these necks should be on bodies. Or yeah. they go bad. So we just started slapping them on bodies. Yeah, and yeah, I remember that. Yeah. You know, because all of a sudden we're like, these necks Let's aren't going to come. Pick up Someone told us that. They're like, you can't leave the necks like this. They'll never come back. Yeah. they just backbone. Yeah. Like, they've, it's bad with no tension. Yeah. You know, so we started just throwing them on bodies with strings just to get them to come back. But then you would hear the sound. You'd be like, whoa. You know, so you realize it was everything, and they think they knew that back then. Mm -hmm. That really, the, it was everything about the guitar that made yeah. the guitar sound like that. It was like just everything coming. But the together. neck, really, that's why we got so into big necks. Exactly. And they I mean, knew that big necks sounded good. stuck with me so much. Yeah, like you, but like so many of us, we were you know, getting so crazy into big necks. And before Chelsea, even before all that, I played guitars that I had before that, and they didn't have big necks, mm -hmm. and I didn't know the difference. Yeah. I liked them; they were fine. You know, like a lot of people, but once we, when someone turns you on to it, like I've turned so many people on the big neck, you can't go back. No. Because first of all, they feel better in your neck. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're much more comfortable. Well, that's why I got, like, my 59 Junior is, like, my neck, where right. it's, like, super round. It's been worked on a ton, so it's right. really round and it has a slight V. Right. That's the neck I, I love like. that. That's, like... Well, what G used to say, he said, you know, there were, like, five or six guys who made those mm -hmm. necks at Gibson in the 50s, and he had so many of those guitars he that he could who? feel which guy was which. Because yeah. they did things that were different. Yeah, yeah, One of the guys did the V-necks. Yep. And I have my 58 Juniors right there has a yeah. V-neck. That's and why I like it. It's a slab body too, which yeah. is awesome. And it has that ne that V neck, and, yeah. I, and my fifty five June, my fifty five gold top has the V neck. Yeah. Remember, I remember the guy Bill Sims Jr. came in with the first time I felt a V neck on an old gold top. He mm. brought in a real gold top. He was like a blues guy in the city. I haven't seen him in years, but we used to go see him play at the rodeo bar. He was yeah. killing a blues guy. But he brought it. He used to play a real fifty five <laughs> gold top, and we were all like, "Whoa, this guy brings his real guitar to like the yeah, rodeo yeah. bar." And he brought it in for a pair one day, and we're like. It has a V-neck. Yeah. I never felt a Gibson with a V-neck. So I was like, Fender Gibson did V-necks? And I'm like, yeah. So and it's it, called a neck back then. Yeah, what GE said is there was one guy, like, he said one guy rolled the shoulders differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He could tell, and then you feel that, you're like, oh, yeah. He probably came from Martin. <laughs> you yeah, know, that was like, his, the way he was taught to build, do a neck, or the way he thought the neck was yeah, the, yeah. the best. Well, stable also, because it gives right, it. Right, the V-neck, well, you can make a bigger, like, classical guitars are V-necks. Yeah. And they're big. And But you can get away with the big, but it's comfortable. Right, because they knew how to carve them properly. Mm -hmm. You know, like, if you just make a big neck, like, just to, for the sake of being big, it usually doesn't feel good. Totally. But if you, like, like Brian could do it, like, make a big neck. Yeah, you bring the shoulders And carve in. it, and it fits in your hand better. Yeah. And it certainly sounds better. And it's more stable anyway. Yeah. You know, those necks you never adjust yeah, this, the trust. That's when I put a V-neck on. It has, I like, just love that feel. Yeah. Like, some people don't like it. You know, like, but, you know, when you play those, like, 50s, you know, like, you know, strats that have V-necks. You know, it's the best. I just love that. It's, you can't get better than that. Yeah, I just dig that. Some people yeah. are like, oh, I hate V-necks. And I was like, all right. You because know. you've never felt one. <laughs> yeah, or it's most just, of the time. Or it feels different than what they're used to when they're just not into it. Totally. You know, like, I don't, it's, I don't like that. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I've always, I've been putting a lot of V-necks on my guitars. I just like them better. Yeah. That's why, like, you know, like, when I found my 50s gold top and had a V-neck, I was like, I'm getting that. I'm jealous of that one. <laughs> I'm still searching for a 54, 55 all gold. That's what mine is. I think mine's a 55 old gold. <laughs> I know. Uh, that was pretty sweet. Yeah. All right. So at this point, we usually ask, well, every, we always ask, the five questions. I'm so ready. We, we are, you're ready. Uh, you don't know what they are, though, because you haven't no, seen any of the podcasts. I have not seen the questions. But they're, ready. We change them every time. Good. No, actually, we don't. That's the whole point of them. <laughs> <laughs> and they were my wife's idea, so I always try to give her credit. Actually, the podcast Love was Melissa. Melissa's idea. She's the best. So it, the whole podcast was her idea, so... She has Big good ideas, Melissa. and the five questions were. She has some ideas I didn't like so much, like haircut and shit like that. Um, Fair enough. Nah, she not like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to come up with something, but she would never say that. Um, okay, so let's ask the five questions, and some All of right. it we've already. You always wind up covering anyway, but um, and yours, yeah. This is like one of those. Like, what were you doing before this? Hanging out with you, every right? Day. You don't have much, right? <laughs> you know, like because you started this so young. But some people had other careers. Yeah, and switched. I mean, but you were basically in high school when I met you. <laughs> yeah, we met right out of high school, and then got into guitar. I never, ever would have thought yeah. I would have had my own shop. Right. Well, you never probably even had another job. Never had yeah. another job. So only that's worked at, only worked at guitar shops. <laughs> right. You, so you never, because most people like, you know, like... You know, I've like, worked for, my two jobs were working for George Ogomowski, doing like house stuff. I was like cleaning his place, 
finding like birthday cards from Eric Clapton and stuff, <laughs> and like stones, reel to reels from the Craw Daddy Club, like crazy <laughs> stuff. And then, yeah, working at Chelsea, and then 30th Street, and then Cobra your Guitars. Business, right. Well, you own your own business, Cobra Guitars. You own your own business. I was 23 your... or 24. <laughs> <laughs> right, so most people, that doesn't work out that way. I had other no. jobs. You know, nothing, there was a career kind of job. No, no, it was no, a but, job job. Yeah. But, you know, some people, like, you know, I was like, touring full time also. On right, you were also a touring musician, yeah. right. So, yeah, so, yeah, not all the questions, but, like, you know, some were interesting, like Josh. Yeah, yeah. What was Josh's thing? He was, like, making drapes. Do the curtains match? Yeah, like that kind of <laughs> shit. <laughs> you know, like, like okay. Yeah, that's You know, awesome. most people do have other things unless they're, yeah. you're lucky enough to get your first job in the guitar business, which yeah. is unusual. That, but, my whole thing was like right place, right time, and right, right attitude. Well, I think Daniel started working at yeah. Chelsea. Uh, he was 13 or 14. Yeah, he I lived think down just, the road. He was like, yeah. yeah, so he was really young. Right, he didn't cape. stay in the guitar business ultimately. But, <laughs> but the you cape. Know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he started. You know, we hired young people there. Yeah, you know, when I was there. It was like, they were Daniel, cheaper was for you. free. You know? Yeah, I mean, but it was a lot of money to me at the day. But you needed time. money because you already were an adult. Yeah. Well, you were an adult, but you, you know, you had your own apartment. <laughs> you yeah, know, like you were living not with your parents anymore. You know, like you know, I was out. I yeah, was out. you're doing your thing. <laughs> you know, like you know, so like, but you know, a lot of people like you know, we hired like like Jackson worked there in high school. Daniel worked there in high school. Little Maddie worked there in uh -huh. high school because you know it's. You know, pocket money, but it was more to be around the guitars. Learning. You know, you know, learn a lot of shit. What did they say, you know, like in the last waltz, you know, like, you know, Robbie Robertson is joining the band. And uh -huh. He goes, you know, oh, do I get, like, money? And he's like, look, man, you're not going to make much money, but you're going to get more pussy than that. Sinatra. <laughs> Am I allowed to say that? I don't know. <laughs> that is the line. <laughs> Quote, unquote. Yeah, we may want to edit that out, but that was the line. That's what Les told me when I started working at Chelsea. Like, you know, like, you're not gonna he's get like, rich, you're not going to make much money, but you're going to get first shot at the best gear in the world. Which... And I was like, I'm in. But also, at the end of the day, like, when I was also working at Chelsea, I remember I was doing coat check in my brother's bar. <gasps> oh, right! The coat <laughs> I, check! I, I, I became forgot. rich. <laughs> remember Rich Cobra for a few yeah, years? Yeah, you had like, like $300 at a night or something. Like four, five, yeah. six. And the coat check thing, doing right. coat check three nights a week, and then I would come in with a bunch of cash. Yeah, I'll buy all these I'm guitars. Like, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone would be like, what the fuck? Yeah. I'd go to 30th Street and they'd be so mad at me. I remember that 61 SG Junior yeah. I bought? And it was mint with the original case, and yeah. I was upset that it wasn't more beat up. Yeah. It wasn't, hey, like, gonna... wasn't checked. So then we started, we played a show in Ithaca. I was like, I'm gonna bring that guitar. It was snowy, I left it in the car. Oh. I was like, oh, it checked. <laughs> <laughs> And then I, I forgot about the I coat bought, check job. Oh, I bought that 1952 Epiphone Zephyr. Oh, right. And I realized that you can't play it hard because I was playing a gig and <laughs> the played it and the bridge, bridge just moved. goes whop. <laughs> <laughs> that happens to everybody. I was like, oh, oh, this is this not good. not going to yeah, work. Now this guitar's not working at all. Had that and then my 59 Junior. Right. I bought yeah, this, you went through some amazing guitars. I had this 59 Junior, the 55 Junior that had, you helped me buy it. You loaned me the money for it. It was a 55 Junior that had a factory neck P90 put That's in. right. With two knobs. That's so it made it right. like a Les Paul with a switch, everything. But That's it was, right. I lent you the money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, then the 65 SG Junior. I had a 74 Tele Deluxe for a yeah. minute. I hated that thing. I thought I, I wanted to like it. <laughs> that and, would happen too. Yeah. I bought a 69 Dan Armstrong. Oh, right. I still uh, have mine. Nice. <laughs> I love that Armstrong. Shrugs. There was a few. You had so many good guitars. It was, that 335. That, oh, yeah, the 66 335, that was burgundy mist, but, but faded to gold. gold. But it's funny, because we would see those on 48th Street, and we thought they were gold. Yeah. We so never know, the knew red that it, faded. Yeah, we thought they were like gold top thing. We didn't know they were faded yeah. burgundy mists. So I don't know why the burgundy cool. mist color bled yeah, out. It must have so been badly. the dye that they used for yeah. that one year. But we thought they were gold. My friend had a 330. <clears throat> yeah. And we just thought it was gold. Yeah, who? I mean, I, if you open, if you move the pickup rates, I'm sure you've like seen them, but we never did. Or under that. the pickguard. Yeah, but we like never did any of that. We just thought it was gold. And yeah. he sold it because they're fed back. You know, like, yeah, but, yeah. You know, like but he had, you know, the same thing. My friend Benji owned that one before, and then That's he sold right. it. That's right. That was a great guitar. I remember Derek Lays talked me into buying that one. But I was like, no, nah, but I like big necks. And he's like, right. I'm, I like P90s. He's like, no, no, no. You this is a good guitar. You right. should buy this. He had the matching Didn't bass. Did you buy the Les Paul that was in a fire? Yep, that Kirk Douglas did for that Heineken commercial. Right. Yeah. That was that a, cool was a fun one. one. Yeah, yeah, that was a fun one. There were two of those or something. Yeah. 
That was a cool one. I had that. And then what else? There was, yeah. You had a shitload of juniors. Shitload, yeah. You had Les Pauls. Yeah. That was the thing about the, working in those guitar shops. You had the first shot. You got, and you can get it to stuff cheap. Like, yeah. That's why I always figured you make your money. if I w- had a real job, which wasn't likely, but you'd spend your money anyway. I would just get to buy guitars anyhow. For more expensive. So, so why even? So this way I'll just get them cheaper, and I won't have to go to the real job. But when I left Third Street and stuff, those those guitars kind of like saved my life. Like, right? You were just selling them off and living. All right, and like buying wood and stuff, like right. bu- helping pay for the shop. Yeah, you know, that was too, the thing like, about them too. They were like money investments. In the bank. Yeah. You know, we put all our money into that. You know, like I put every penny I had into my Me guitars. Too. Yeah. You know, if I. I had a thousand dollars. I was shopping for a three thousand dollar guitar. <laughs> I'm almost there. I'll just borrow the rest of the money. And then I was lending you guys all the money yeah. to buy your. Oh, I need a thousand bucks. Here you go. Yeah. You know, like because then guitar. I was making a few dollars. I was the manager. Yeah, of the but store. give me extra two hundred bucks. Right. <laughs> but you are, were also always like, no, you need to buy this guitar right. because it's the shit. Well, Danny was like that with me. Yeah. You know, he. I remember him calling me and going like, "Look, I just got this three thirty five. You need to and I've, I bought and sold the same guitar a bunch of times. It's the best sounding 335. It's a 64. It's a block marker. It's what you want. Go sell some shit. Do what you got to do, but buy this guitar. Yeah. I'll give it to you for whatever I got for Yeah, it. yeah. He did the same thing with the gold top. Yeah. That's how I got that 55 gold top. And I was working at 30th Street. Mm-hmm. And Danny called me and goes, look, there's an all gold gold top. I know you want one of these. Ugh. Do what you have to do and get the money. This is like a, a really slim yeah. guitar. And that's when they were really going up. I now paid it's a, a $40,000 guitar. I don't think it's, I think it's came down because well, everything did. But like. And it was the top of the market. I paid a lot for it. But I, not like I had the money. I just had so many other guitars. Yeah, yeah I remember I that. I sold off a couple of juniors, a couple of other things and threw in five I grand. I was so excited when you got that. I was, oh, I was like ecstatic. Like, yeah. And I still have it. Like I played it the other day. Like, because I have so many guitars, but then you pull that. Like, I, I got a, a 61 shit. Esquire recently. Nice. It's the perfect 61 Esquire. And they don't all sound good, but when the, you play a great one, and a lot of them sound like that. But, but that's how they sound. Because the Esquires and Juniors, I think, is also why we love them, too. I was talking with Richard Fortas about this. It's a different magnetic pull on that's the strings. That's what says, because it's this not being pulled down here. Exactly. Right. So they're really open. Yeah, like my Esquire, like the Godfather had it. You know, he, you know, he, he said, oh, you know, I... I got this Esquire you brought it over my house one day, and I was like, oh, yeah. man, this is like a, the, the good Esquire. Yeah. Just doing, you play a chord, and just like, whoa, this is happening. Yeah, yeah, the pickup yeah, yeah. is barky. And then, like, you know, the Godfather, so I was like, you know, hey, if you're ever going to sell this, you know, like, I'd be interested in yeah. it. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, they wanted to sell it, and I just happened to have the money, which never happens. No. You know? <laughs> Anytime you say that, and they say, oh, I have the guitar, like, oh, I don't have any money. Yeah, you got to sell know? the car. <laughs> right, I just happened to have sold, like, a guitar in the shop for a lot of money. I just happened to have it sitting yeah, in, like, yeah. my underwear drawer. I was like, fuck it, I'm buying that guitar, you know, like, cause I didn't have, like, an old telly. I had parts tellies. I, I remember, you had a cool parts one. Yeah, I had that even when I was like young, less. like, 60s parts, yeah, you yeah. know, like, I had the body, and I, you know, like, and that's what I played in, like, a lot of my bands, but I never had, like, a really together one. I never had yeah. a black guard, because even when they were five grand when I started working. Everything yeah. was five grand when I started working at Chelsea. Totally. A gold top was five grand, like a P90 gold top, yeah. and a black guard was five grand. But I didn't have five grand. No, it might as well be ten now. Yeah, it's a million dollars. I didn't same, have five. It's the same reach as it right. is now. Yeah, it was, it was always out of reach. Yeah. That's why we bought refins. But that, remember that junior that I wanted to get from Danny, that TV yellow broken oh, headstock yeah. junior that broke my heart because it went to some like metal kid. Yeah, oh, that's right. But he had it priced at like $4,500 when juniors were two grand. He's like, this one's really special. It's TV yellow. Broken headstock, I don't care. Yeah, I don't give a shit. Find another one. That was Danny's whole find another yeah. one. Yeah, like, <laughs> and you would go down the street and find another one. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. But not like that. But but he always was hip to that. Yeah, Danny was super hip to certain things that no one was hip to. Not at like, all. And then people became hip to it later. Yeah. You know, like, and like it's like Danny Danny crazy. It's like you're crazy. He's right. like, no. No, he's like, this is the shit. Like you know, like he had that certain thing. Like he saw it. Yeah. You know, like he had a dumbbell in the back for, for Forever. That's why he would hold on. We'd be like, sell it. He's like, nah. Nah. He's like, nah, I don't feel like it. People aren't hip to it Then yet. he'll, right, he'll sell it when the time is right. Yeah. But he was into like, you know, you know, like, what are those, those Brazilian Rosewood Armin's. premier oh, guitars? Oh, premiers. I, I'm looking for one now. They're <laughs> fucking great. My friend just got one. Yeah, Danny would buy that They're all stuff. Brazilian Rosewood. Yeah. <laughs> Solid Brazilian, Brazilian Rosewood guitar. <laughs> you know, Danny would buy it. We'd be like, what is With that With a scroll thing? in it? Yeah, that I just, thing. I'm doing a scroll right now because of that guitar. Right. I remember yeah, Danny had Vega one. Vega guitars yeah. Danny was hip to. That's why, like, guys like Billy Gibbs and all those guys would go to Chelsea. Because with Jackson have. Brown. Because he just knew what was cool. Yeah. He was into magnetone amps before. Way before. People really even 
and talk to yeah, them. Yeah. I remember selling them to like someone to Stephen Stills and then to Pete Townsend. You know, those all those guys I think Robert Cray yeah, I think yeah. started using a magnetone. But Dan was buying those. He years had remember he had the wall them. of magnetones. Yeah, like we'd always magnetone. But they would always do this because yeah. it's not a flat top it had the handle <laughs> so they'd always like yeah. pivot yeah like, yeah, like oh, that wall yeah yeah that wall of like cool <laughs> shit like TV Remember front I got, fenders I, I got that blackface basement and then he sold me from the way in the back the 210 Fe, uh, Vox Berkeley yeah. thing with the piping yeah he gave me that for like nothing yeah. he's like ah there was so much good gear in there. That's why, like, you just know, endless. And, and you could learn how to use it. Mm-hmm. You know, you have you know people like, oh, this is what you do with those. Yeah. You know, like that's what you oh, miss about a guitar shop. That's what a fuzz really right? sounds. You like. can find out so much shit on like the internet. You can go on forums and all this. But there's nothing like unless what, you play we'll a just 57 hang out in there and then GE is showing you how it's. Oh, when you do these, I remember I got my first Tweed Deluxe, and G was like, like, "No, you gotta take them. these tubes out and put these in." And he went home and got me tubes. Yeah. He's like, "Put these in your amp." You'll he was be, just the most generous oh, guy in the world. He's, and that's like when I was like, eighteen and stuff, sitting with him. Yeah, and it's like that's when Danny would be like, "Dude, can you do something?" I'm like, oh, "Sorry, we're all sitting around." No, uh, he's talking. talking. <laughs> yeah, we're talking with G Smith. He's yeah. like, "No, you just go you sweep. just sweep the floor or something." <laughs> it's two feet wide. Like, okay, yeah, it's sweeped. It's done. Yeah. <laughs> when we get the. Open the door, but it's like you get sucked into that. Yeah, like, like, yeah, you like, because it was always cool people. In yeah, there. it'd be like Tom Peterson, you know, like all these people, you know, like totally buying a firebird base. I just ran Peter into him at the Nam show, and we were talking about how shipping guitars. We'd always put the dirty village voice, <laughs> oh, the gay blade, yeah, the gay blade. <laughs> that was our trademark because we were in Chelsea. Just put it in there, right? That yeah. we thought that was like clever. But he's like, like, your guitar is coming from Chelsea, New yeah. York. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna have some character. <laughs> Plus, it was free. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're just going go to the lobby of the Chelsea Hotel, get, the get the whole fucking thing, throw it in there. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like, but like that was that was primitive, like shipping things. We would make our own. You know, we would just do we, so many times having to make cardboard boxes out of just out of boxes. Nothing. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Like I'm, like, it was more tape than anything. And you would just send it. <laughs> you know, it's like, and then Danny had a remember in the olden days. It's so funny because everything we used to do was wrong. Mm-hmm. You find out, like, remember, we, you had to detune the strings. Yeah, don't do that. Don't. And, and, and anyone who built, has ever built a guitar said that is the dumbest thing you could do. Yeah. Take all the tension off the neck and send it. <laughs> but I remember unpack. Danny was like, "Did you detune it?" We'd unpack the box just to make sure we did. It was yeah, so yeah. important. I know. It turns out it's the worst thing you can fucking do. Taking the tubes. Out of the end. Yep, another thing. The dumbest fucking yep. thing you could do. We'd take Just each tube out, wrap, wrap it, 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 put a number on it. You know how every amp got broken? The guy didn't know how to put the tubes back in. Every time. Every fucking time. <laughs> but it, it was just the way things were done. And it was all wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because all of a sudden I started getting guitars shipped to me and I'm like, it's tuned to pitch. This guy's a psycho. Yeah. Why would you send a guitar tuned to pitch? Because it's a guitar builder. He knows yeah. not to detune it, but that was like the most important thing. Like number one, you detune that fucking yeah. guitar, and that's totally wrong. Don't ever detune it. It's guitar. so funny. I don't even detune my guitar on the plane. No, it turns out. And yeah, they would tell you the the pressure is you know too much, you know, and it's gonna your guitar will explode, it's and it's all bullshit. It's fine. You know, <laughs> it's funny how these things evolve. Well, the internet also. You know, a lot of the information is good, and a lot of it's bad. Mm-hmm. A lot of it's erroneous. It's just not right. Yeah. But a lot of it is right. Yeah. So then people start sharing just information. And so sharing. like, and that's why guitar builders are like, don't you tune your? Because I would get a guitar from a guitar builder, and it'd be in tune. And I'd be yeah. like, it's tuned to pitch. Oh, he must have just forgot. And I would yeah. call him, and be like, oh, you know, you didn't tune that guitar. It's like, <laughs> why would I detune a guitar? Yeah. To ship it to take all the tension off the neck. It's a terrible thing to do. Yeah. And then it's going to shift slightly. You're going to put tension back on. It's not going to be right when you get yeah, it. Yeah, the setup's different. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the most important thing yeah. back then, like, and taking the tubes out of the amps, that's fucking crazy. You know, because most people can't put a tube back in. I did it wrong recently, because you can put a tube in. And it feels like it. And it feels like it's right, and it'll go in. Yeah, always go in. And I blew up an amp. <laughs> this is recently, this is like six months ago. <laughs> it's not like I've learned that much. It but happens. I didn't realize it could go in wrong. Yeah. I thought the string, the, I thought the tube bed was there, so it couldn't go in. Yeah. But it did. Maybe this 
maybe the socket wasn't yeah, was too forgiving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's scary. That's why I'm scared to touch amps. I don't touch amps. They're terrifying. Don't the touch shipping them. an amp is terrifying. Yeah. You know, I like don't it's, even deal with them. But I don't certainly don't take the tubes out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, just call Eric. Hey. <laughs> yeah, it's it's too scary. But I have, yeah. I've been really good, lucky. I've had like great guys at my local UPS store who will yeah. pack the amp for me. Nice. And they pack it. And every like comment when they people get it was like packed beautifully because you really have to do that. Oh yeah. You know, I was like, I don't know. It was on the streak of deluxe reverbs. You know, I got like six or seven blackface deluxe reverbs, and like, actually, Daniel bought me a few of them. I shipped a few of them like far, like to Belgium. <laughs> and they all, I had Jamie tune up my Jamie Simpson from, you know, Booyah Amps tune up every single one of them. They were perfect. Had these people pack them in all of them. Not a single problem with a single one of them. It was an amazing streak. Because it awesome. had to, eventually, you're going to have a problem. All you have to do is just break one little yeah, solder yeah. joint. Exactly. In, and in a very old amp. Yeah, you know, to have a problem, and they were all getting there fine. That's you know, the best. like yeah, it was great. But every time I ship an amp, I finally had one broken recently. You know, a black vault, which was sad. Yeah, they yeah. must have dropped this from, like, off a conveyor belt because it broke through the cabinet. They broke the cabinet. Whoa. And Geo from Black Bolt was so cool. He's like, just have the guy send me the amp. I'll just put him in a new cabinet. Yeah, yeah. You can give me a couple hundred bucks of cabinet or whatever. But like, they broke through the ca a solid wood cabinet. <laughs> so it, it, I guess they could fall off conveyor belts, yeah. you know. Like, you know, but the amp itself worked. You know, he built it so well where the the electronics worked. Yeah, they just broke through the cabinet. It was <laughs> shattered. You know, it's like, all right, that That's happens. Nice. But you know, you don't always get that unlucky. But you know, like. All right, so that was very. We didn't <laughs> back to the five questions. Question one. Yeah, well, now we've started drinking. We're loosening up. You know. But. <laughs> question number two. All right, so question number two. What are you listening to these days? Uh, I have been listening to, um, actually some Guns N' Roses. Use your illusions. <laughs> one and two. Well, not, not much has changed there no. <laughs> since I met you. Um, but that's what happens with great music. Yeah, I know. It just A stays lot. with you. A lot more funk since Moss has been around. A lot more fusion. Yeah, he's into all that. It's awesome. Well, he's into jazz. Yeah, or... and is his, his father dad, a jazz musician? Yeah, his dad's a champion. This guy Terry Masahino. Right. Herbie Hancock was his keyboard player. Steve Gadd was his right. drummer. Anthony Jackson playing bass. Yeah, Moss was always like hip to that. Yeah. Stuff. So, and then recently we just got Moss's dad's whole record collection on top oh, of it. Oh shit! And it's like mint. We've actually been listening to a lot of this band YMO, Yellow Magic Orchestra. And they're, they're so much incredible. jazz. Incredible. Yeah. These guys are like synth pop fusion. It's awesome. There's so much of that kind of music. So, I'm getting really into like jazz lately. Yeah. Like, but it's, funky jazz. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I've always listened to Coltrane. And all it's great. Shit. But like, there's all this jazz. There's a million things. And so every guy on that record plays. has his own record. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Been listening to a lot of Joe Walsh and then through that, Joe Vitale. Mm -hmm. His drummer, which yeah. is the best. Some of those Joe Walsh Harbor. records, like those early Joe Walsh records. We listen to it all day. Yeah, that Barnstormer. Stuff. Incredible. Joe Vitale is the drummer. Right. Then he did his own record, and it's Joe Walsh on that. Is that right? It's what's that called? It's called Plantation Harbor, the best record ever. Right. That's so much. And music. then I got more into solo artists than the band. So like, I got really into uh, John Entwistle's solo records. And there's one whistle and rhymes, and it's Peter Frampton on guitar. Right. Well, Robert Johnson played on some of that stuff. That's yeah. It's just like he so was much in like good his, shit. Yeah. 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 I've never. And heard Joe that. Walsh and Joe Vitale did a record with him called "Too Late the Hero." That's right. Which That's is the best record ever. I don't think I've ever heard it. It's fun. I'll send it to you. It's, it's amazing. Fucking great. It's one of my favorite. But the records. thing is, you have to buy all those records on vinyl. Yeah. Yeah. Like exactly. you can't listen to that shit on any other format. But then also like Ronnie Wood's solo records, I've got my own album to do. My favorite album. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but like these records, what I like more about those records. I think I turned you on to that record. But you did. That was always my favorite rock and roll record. Like, it's the best. They're just there partying. It's the Stones, the Faces. Yeah. And are all Willie Weeks record. playing bass. Like everyone there just hanging yeah, out. Yeah, Newmark. You yeah. know, it's all these amazing people. That's an amazing album. Like someone turned me on to that because they knew I was really into the Stones. Yeah. Like, you know, but it's Ronnie Wood's ago. home studio, so everyone's just there partying. Keith Richards was living there. They don't care how many records they sell. They, yeah, they were there's just, no pressure. But Keith wrote two of those songs, and supposedly, like, Mick Jagger was pissed because they were such good songs. Yeah. They should have been so, like, sure, the one you need. Incredible. You know, like, and Mystifies Me, one of yeah. my favorite oh. songs in the and world. And Sunvolt did Mystifies Me. I thought we were the only people who were into oh. that. The first Sunvolt album, which was one of my favorite albums ever, yeah, yeah. the last song is Mystifies Me. Look at that. You know, it's like, that's, whoa, that's they're into like this too. My I love this band, yeah. and that's obviously, yeah. we're listening to the same stuff because they're doing Mystifies Me. 
And I do mystifies me in my bands it's, all the time. Yeah, it's, it's the like, best. It's and Wicked fun. Messenger, you've been yeah. doing forever too. Yeah, I'm I did Wicked Messenger last night. Yeah. <laughs> but like that's an amazing that, album like you too. That's so John Wesley music, Harding. Yeah, you know, like, yeah, that's that's the thing about you know like music too. It's like some people listen to a lot of music and some people don't. So you know, I know like, a lot of people don't. Like, you no know, great musicians who don't listen to, you know, like they don't have record collections. Yeah. They don't have stereos. Yeah, yeah. You know, like. But like one of the best musicians I n knew ever, just didn't even have a stereo. Yeah, it's just like oh, I just listen to radio, you know. Yeah. Like, but he was it certainly did at one point. Totally. Yeah, you know, he just did his like life Jeff's situation. Like Jeff's collection is nuts, and he always he's giving me stuff. He got me really into Gene Clark, oh. singer of the birds. And like, well, he got me into Gene Clark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. But then we all went fucking crazy. Every Gene Clark thing I have has Jeff's handwriting. That's when we were working at 30th Street. Yeah. You know, like, I always liked the birds because I like Clarence Yeah, but White. then, like, but I didn't. Clark's record. I liked like, the later birds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I liked the Roger McGuinn birds. Exactly. And then he was like, listen to Roadmaster. You're like, what? And I do half those songs in my bands now. <laughs> there you it's go. It's like, you gotta do Gene Clark songs. Yeah. They're fucking brilliant. The best. You know, like, you know, Through the Morning, Through the Night, you know, like Robert Plant did on that record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, a million people have done People don't realize, you know, so you want to be a rock and roll star, you know, it's like the, the Tom Petty song. No. Tom Petty was so into Gene Clark. He's you know? the man. But he would have been much bigger if he, I think he just had tremendous oh. <laughs> drinking problems. Yeah. Like, but, you know. Like, and all, yeah, fears of everything. But. Yeah, he wouldn't, he wouldn't fly. They yeah, were like, yeah. well, a bird won't fly. You know, like that whole thing. Yep. But like, but that's amazing. So yeah, Jeff was cra just he, crazy. Just crazy music. When you had, you had a, a band for a minute with a girl singer. Kendra. Torpedo. Right. That was an amazing That was band. really fun. I remember, and Ricky was in it. Yeah. So, well, Pickles was the first drummer, <laughs> right. but he didn't want to come to practice, so we fired him and then got Ricky. fired the guy you were in the, on the band? In the other band, yeah. But he didn't care. But then, <laughs> but then we got Ricky to play drums, and then Pickles was rehired as a right. keyboard player. So I remember seeing you guys at some club downtown with Ricky on guitar and Jeff yeah. playing bass, I think, yeah. and you playing guitar, and it was killer. It was super fun. It was an amazing yeah. band. I was like, holy shit, this we is one of the best bands ever. Drunk. Heard. Very drunk, very loud. I had my park with Yeah, the like fucking hotel. loud. And super Ricky, loud. you know, I think there's a video of it somewhere. Because I remember videos it. Of it. Yeah, like Ricky, you know, I just would just kill it. And we would all just borrow guitars from the shop. Yeah, it was all shop guitars. <laughs> so like yeah, Ricky was playing like a Cobra guitar. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but that oh, band was great. And she's still she's Kendra Moore, she's great. She still plays and like, yeah, does her own thing. That was a great band. We we were probably gonna but then, do something. But then at the same time, Jeff was doing his Star Cross Signs. That. Yeah. And all like, like psychedelic, Clark. yeah. Psychedelic and he birds. sang so well and he played so and yeah. he wrote so well. There was that, uh, I played in I played three were, shows. Had, yeah, I remember he had one of those songs and I was like, Holy shit. Yeah, yeah. He's an incredibly oh, he's talented guy. Yeah. I think you guys all played on that record yeah, yeah. anyway. But I was like, Whoa, yeah. shit, he's really talented. Oh. Yeah, you know, you're man. like Caveman has all super talented fucking people in it. We've been lucky with that. Of just like you know, Sam's in that band. You know, Sam did. I would listen to like I did a record with Sam, and he wrote one of the songs and sang it, and I was like, Jesus, talented yeah. motherfucker. Yeah, if you would have said this was a, you know a band from the '60s that was huge, you'd be yeah. like, yeah, it sounds like Badfinger. Yeah, you know, his, and Ned playing his drums. vocal range is also... incredible. You know, like he sang high harmony in my band, but he he sang that only one or two songs, but his voice is fucking incredible. Sixties, like and he's playing like the or, he's playing synth in your band you know, like, for a million years. Yeah. You know, like, but you know, yeah, you all should check out Caveman. The yeah. band is fucking amazing. Um, some fun. Let's move on to the third question. Yeah, so that's what I've been listening to. A lot of fun stuff. So you may not have any. So you're you know you're in a different situation because you you found your thing so young. But what would you be doing if you weren't doing the guitar thing? I guess uh, touring even more. Po I don't know. If, I don't even know if that's possible. <laughs> yeah, like, see, so you, with your thing, it's different because, like, a lot of people had other career pets. Maybe you know, maybe like, I would most care more chef. about money and, like, yeah, I love to cook. Maybe I would have found that seems to be a common thing. More. Like my friend Jamie cooks all the time. Oh, I cook almost even night. Bob was like, you know, like he's like, I work. In I just I just got a knife from Matt Rubendahl. It's awesome. I have I to use do it that. every night. I love that guy. He's the best. I want to get him all the time. His shop is down the street from my shop. Is that right? He's on 18th Street. I'm on 34th Street. Wow. When was the last time you saw him? A few days ago. No. We hang out all the time. He's See, when the I best. first opened his Mountain, new guitars are I'm psycho. Sure. When I first opened Mountain Cat, I didn't know. Like my friend Alex moved up here mm -hmm. a year or two later, and he could do all the stuff Matt could do. And Matt didn't want to work in a guitar shop anymore. He didn't want to do repairs. Yeah, he has his own nice but shop. He was in Red Hook back then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He and I would Red drive Hook. from here to Red Hook, and he would, like, if I had a 
good nice. friends. He would do them for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't want to do them for like anyone else. We knew I wouldn't give him shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bust his balls about prices and shit. But he, what an awesome dude. He's the best. So now he started making knives. I see that ruby They're, knives. Uh, yeah, I bought one. They're fucking great. Right. See, that's the thing. You know, it's like it's all about the knife. It's like it's about the guitar. Like if you're gonna even knife, I was saying that would like when you cut. You know. Yeah. Like, you know, you can get a, a knife, or you can get, you can a, get knife. a knife. <laughs> you know, like you know. And, and it's guys cool because it. he's using his guitar. Well, his guitar building, he, he, he builds it's, like he's rosewood, flamenco, like yeah. flamenco guitars, but no glue. No, the neck joint is just in, like. Cool. But he was doing that. Like I, I brought my friend Travis there. Like you know, like when I, you know, I was first doing Mountain Cat, but. I didn't, didn't know anybody to do high-end restorations yet, mm -hmm. and, I, and Ruby was a friend, so I would drive out there. Yeah, you know, we go like, oh, let's go to Red Hook. This is like Red Hook now. Yeah. Like my brother now lives, lives in Red fancy. Hook. Now it's like happening. It's not super. But fancy this was yet, like Red Hook. This was, it was Red Hook, and <laughs> yeah. he was in like one of those fucked up buildings. Yeah, you know, but in you the know, corner, no doing heat. his thing. Yeah, you know, like you know, and it was super dope. But he was such a cool guy. I haven't spoke to him in a long time, and it's one of those things I want to reconnect with him. But I really want to have him on the podcast. He's the best. And he his classical us. guitars. Well, he was making those when we first. I know him through Trainer yeah. originally, because they were involved in the very first version of Rivington guitars. Look at that. Ruben Dole was a Trainer guy. Oh. He found him somewhere because he came from Ithaca. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. think he's from Ithaca, but he worked at Ithaca Guitar Works somehow. Somehow he came through Ithaca. I don't know where he originates. And then Trainer, the very first version of Rivington guitars was Trainer and Ruben Dole knew the guy who owned the building. Yeah. And, he, and they opened Rivington Guitars. With Howie. No, it was way before Howie. Oh. Huh. You know, because they offered me, I was going to be the manager of Rivington. I they offered me this. that, but I was very happy at Chelsea. I remember. So I didn't want to leave. Yeah, 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 but, yeah, yeah. But Ruby and Chris Trainer, it was in between, it was after, like, after one of his bands and before another one of his like bands Orange was Nomi hanging or... in the city, right? And they'd done. They knew the guy who owned that building. Wow. And they, they made Rivington guitars. Wow. And then Howie took it over after that. That's awesome. Because I know Howie for a million years. Yeah. He was a customer of mine at, at Chelsea. Yeah. And we were both recording albums in Hoboken at Levy Kravitz's studio <laughs> at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And our dude Albert DeFure was an engineer at Lenny Kravitz Studio in Jersey. He probably did my record. <laughs> Because <laughs> there, there were only a couple of engineers there. Yeah, yeah. That was, no, he was, that was one of the Waterfront. Guys. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was an amazing studio. It was all Lenny Kravitz's stuff. They had the Sgt. Pepper board. Yep. He told yeah, we me ran our shit. stuff through that. So I did a, a record yeah. there with my band at the time, Torn Afraid, and then that record got played on a TV show a ton. Yeah. We just went and played live. That's what like, we would yeah, do back yeah, yeah. then. We didn't have a lot of money. I, I just found one of those CDs. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good band. It was a great band. <laughs> yeah, like, it's funny. I with all friends. like, oh, you're, you know, that was a really good... But, yeah, yeah. you know, we lived for that band the way you did. I mean, yeah. We rehearsed every just night. You know, we, did, we were living our thing. But it, our thing got bought by a TV show. I remember. So all that stuff from Waterfront Studios, you know, like was on this big TV show at yeah, the time. Yeah. It was, but the stuff sounded really good. And it was Lenny's gear was there. Cop show or something, right? Yeah. I remember. It was I, the people who did The Wire right before yeah, The Wire. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was like, and it was the CSI guy was the star of it. So it was I like, remember this. Well, but at the time, it was a really hot TV show. And yeah. We were lucky enough. I remember you showed it to me. Yeah, we were on TV. Yeah. You know, we were like, whoa. <laughs> you know, this is like, it was like a big deal. We got money. <laughs> yeah. Money was awesome. You know, like, but we were really, like, psyched. So, like, it's, it's a small world that way. Oh. But getting back to Matt Rubinall, um He's the man. Yeah. So and yeah. Matt, if you're watching this, you have to come be on our podcast. Big time. Okay, let's be moving along. So I'd probably be a chef, I think. But it's funny because that came up a couple people. Like my friend Jamie, I mean, he cooks every time you're there. Yeah, yeah. You know, so he's like, oh, I'd probably own a restaurant. Yeah. And then even night I, I do dinners at my house with like 10 people. Like, right. I love it. It seems to go hand in hand. Like, I cook Just for myself. Something. I make quinoa yeah, yeah, and yeah, shit yeah. like that. But I'm not a terribly good but cook. I, but I also don't make a talk. I do love hosting it. Like, Right. Yeah, and just like have people. Your house. There's something with food, you know, like totally. that's a whole thing. Yeah. You know, like you enjoy a meal together. It's you awesome. Have some wine. You totally. know, it's like a thing. But a three, I think three of the people we've done so far were like, I'd be in the restaurant business. What well, seems to be a similar thing. Yeah. So like if you could work in a brain. restaurant, you could work in a guitar shop. Yeah. You know, like, you know, it's that same kind of thing. My brother like, Joe's also owned places too. Oh, so that's it's right. Like, yeah, it'd probably be somewhere. Yeah, in it's there. in your blood anyway. Yeah. Okay, here's an interesting one. No, 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 no. You, don't, you don't have to answer it if you don't want. Um, what is one thing a lot of people don't know about you? Um, hmm, not an easy question. No, off the top of your head, you know. Like, yeah, I guess uh, that I grew up on Roosevelt Island. Well, I knew that too. 
Yeah. Well, you had a very interesting <laughs> upbringing because I met your father. Yeah, yeah. You got to, I guess, yeah, maybe the... You were a wild bunch of guys. Yeah, my dad saw the family of just like a bunch of dudes. Awesome dudes. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're a bunch of brothers. Bunch of brothers. Yeah, I've got, yeah, maybe that, like, I've got three amazing brothers, different mom, same dad. Right. And you guys were all like basically brothers. living in a house together. Yeah. Way. Like, like when they would graduate high school they'd co- or college, come back. Live, right. That's how I got into music. I mean, my brother Joe got me into music. Right. Uh, I was eight or nine, and this was like in the early 90s, and, and he, or I was even younger than that, and he came home from college and had a rack of CDs. I was like, if you want to listen to something, do whatever you want, just put it back. And I would never be Fair good enough. at that. But, yeah, right. <laughs> like, I'm not oh, doing that. Like, <laughs> Fuck this. Yeah, Guns N' Roses, I'm listening yeah, to this. I'm in. This is sucky. But <laughs> it's funny, like, he got me into that. And then he had, when he moved out, he had a roommate, Eric, I think was his name. He played guitar. And that's how I started playing guitar. It was for my brother Joe. He, like, he gave him money. And he was like, dude, take my brother. To, and he took me to, to Manny's. And I got a classical guitar. And then after that, just started playing. But yeah, I saved my brothers. Awesome. Yeah, champs. Okay. Um, this is a kind of general one. What's on the horizon for James Carpenter? Um, well, we're making a new record as Caveman, and it's feeling really good. Uh, and more guitars. Yeah, just building a lot. Yeah, more I mean, you're so young. Yeah, you know, these things are just starting. You know, like, basically, I've but they've come such a long way. Like yeah. even just looking, like I've been looking at this the whole time and yeah. looking at that. But your guitars from five years ago don't even look like this. Totally. Like, I mean, I went from, like, making tellies and strats... To that. To my own stuff. But that's the thing. Builders have a real arc. You yeah. know, like, that's what I've noticed. Like, even when I hooked up with all well, the builders I initially hooked up with, which now I think is around... I think it's eight and a half years yeah. ago that I opened Mountain Cat. And, and they're, they were very primitive versions of what they are now. Totally. If they've been building this whole time, which most of yeah. them have. You get better with everything. It's and most again. of the things were really primitive at the beginning. Yeah. Like, you look at their old guitars, and you're like, okay. Dude, I see an old guitar, and I'm like, wow, that's what I used to do? And they, But it doesn't mean they're not good guitars. No, 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 it's just a different... But there might be a little bit of, like, you know, grain sink here. Totally, <laughs> yeah. or a different mindset. Right, or a different thing. <clears throat> the thing wasn't fully realized, but they were really good guitars. You know, totally. I still have the first Banshee Doug Cow ever made. Yeah. He said to me. It's a fucking great guitar. Yeah. It's not quite what they became. Totally. Like, I but, see my old Cobra guitars, I'm like, wow. Well, those know? Cobra guitars were great. They were fun, yeah. I had, like, awesome. I, I was looking through old pictures, and I saw the very, f- it was, like, the third go- Cobra guitar I ever made was a Thin Line Telly I had. Yeah. And it was a killer yeah, guitar. Yeah, yeah, that was I a good one. sold it, I Maple think. Neck. Or you took it back and sold it. Yeah, but I, I would wish I kept that guitar. Yeah, yeah. Like, everyone had that guitar for a minute. Yeah. Everyone really did. <laughs> we were did. all playing that guitar. With the just, cut bridge. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, that's... And I, would, and I screwed in... That was a G. Smith thing, too. Screwing the pickups right into the bottom. Right. So you already were doing different things. Yeah. You know, like... But that's where, like... Because that's where, they, like, there's a lot of guys who build a telly. Yeah. Say, you know, like... But then there's a lot of things you can do. But your guitar's really... You're not scared to just go and make something like that. Yeah. Like, that's completely... That's, like, part... Big speed guitar part. Yeah, and that I love that gigantic guy. Les Paul special yeah. kind of guitar. That's kind of a mix of kind of everything we like. Yeah, like you know, Paul one's big guitar, like, and all your guitars like that. Like look at yeah. that thing. I think a lot of people are scared to go out beyond. Definitely. You know where you were never scared of that. Your very first headstock. I remember people going like, "What the fuck? What is the that? fuck is that? It's too big." And I'm like. I don't. With the little know, flip but up. But people were scared to see anything that didn't look. I got that all the time. It's like that's not Fender or Gibson. It's like, but I'm not Fender or Gibson. Right. But you immediately didn't care about that. But yeah. you never really cared about any of that kind of shit. I mean, you wore a scuba suit to work. <laughs> <laughs> so you always. I didn't care. You, you never gave a shit about that yeah. kind of thing. But like, you literally showed up to work in a scuba suit. Yeah. On a skateboard. <laughs> yep. So like, there's those kind of people. <laughs> <laughs> and a, but you know that's what's cool. You know, there's somebody who could build a telly. Yeah. Like just it's a, like Chio Han. You know, now he has his own new model that's fucking kick ass. Mm-hmm. But for a long time, he was just known as the guy who built the, the telly. telly. But it was just a, it was it's really good. It was just the fucking best telly you yeah. could ever put your it's hands great. on. And people would go like, "It's just a telly." Was well, expensive. I'm like, just play it. Yeah. You know, like so. I mean, even when Night Bob came over the first time, and uh, you know, and not the first time he came over, I was like, "Oh, have you ever tried these Chio Han guitars?" Yeah. And He's like, no. You know, I was like, here, check this out. And he's like, oh, it's Telly. I'm like, yeah. You know, and I think I showed it to him, like, more than once, maybe twice. Yeah. And it's Night Bob. So, like, you know, 
he's yeah, seen everything. He's seen everything. And then he's playing, and it's like, it's a good guitar. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like, you know, then they got really into it. Yeah, but I think yeah. it took everyone, like, it's just a telly. But, but it's done really but well. But Chiho just has something. Yeah. Yeah, now he has this new model, and he's really killing it. He moved up the new, he moved up yeah, right yeah, by right LaBella. By yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's just killing it. Yeah. But his guitar was just a telly, but it was just not, it wasn't just a telly. Yeah. He had, but it, he worked within the format of it being a telly. Totally. And then he you made know, it your own. And then he just owned it. Mm -hmm. He just made it, you know, more than it ever really was. But you didn't do that. You just said, okay, here's, I'm just going to draw I'm outside the lines. my favorite lines. guitar, like what I would want. Because I was always into weird vintage shit. Right. And you have that, you know, like aesthetic where you could put these things together and make them work like that. Yeah. You know, that's not a guitar that existed already. Yeah. But it looks like it did. If you would yeah. say, oh, this, you know, some guy made it in 1956 and then he went insane <laughs> and killed everybody. You'd be like, wow, it's really fucking cool. Like, yeah. it makes sense. You could see that being, it's somewhere between a premier guitar, which no one even knows what those are. Yeah. But you do because you work at Chelsea. Yeah. You know, like, that's, you know, and, but that doesn't look like that. Yeah. So you could have just stopped there. Yeah. You know, a lot of people do that. They come up with totally. a thing and that's their thing. Yeah. I make this. And yeah. this is a very cool guitar. You know, that's enough. For, yeah. But then you make that, and then this is not the same, and, and this. So you're a different case, but you always were, because you're you. And that's what's interesting about it, because everyone finds their voice within these things. Exactly. You know, if your thing is a telly or a strat, I mean, there's guys who just make a strat, but they're fucking good strat. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? Like, exactly. you know, just, wow, that guy works within that thing. He's going to, he's not going to draw outside the lines, but he's going to stay within the lines and just keep Yeah. And, and, just, and you can do that forever. And that's... Awesome. Yeah. And there's a lot of guys who do that. You know, like, <clears throat> all right, it's a strap, but it's slightly, maybe they do something here and there, but a strap's a great fucking design. You know, like, you know, Leo Fender designed yeah. that. It's solid. Totally. It works. It works yeah. every time. But if you can find your voice within, say, that, like those would, like Chiho was doing, mm -hmm. or, you know, there's a lot of guys, like even Josh, you know, yeah. Broadcasters are strats and tellies. He has an original design now. It's really cool. Yeah. Very much what you do, because he deals with vintage guitars. Yeah. He's melded things that are somewhere in the middle. But it's hard to, like, a lot of guys. It's hard to find something that's different. Totally. You didn't seem to really have a hard time with it. You immediately started coming up with things. Yeah. But it's hard to find something that doesn't look like, oh, I know exactly what he did. He combined a Les Paul and a 335. Yeah, yeah. Or whatever. You know, like, that's the interesting thing about the boutique guitar movement. You know, and, and you know, I like to see it as a movement. Totally. You know, like, because it's so interesting, and I get to talk no to the rules. people. And you get to talk to the people, yeah. and they all share this passion for this thing that we do. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so cool about it. You know, like... That's what I find exciting about it. Like yeah. vintage guitars, when we were doing them at Chelsea, there was nothing more exciting. Like yeah. any guitar that was made after 1980, I'm not, uh, even, not even looking time. at it. Same Fuck here. that! That's not even a guitar. No, thank you, you were just so crazy for old guitars. Yeah. That's why when I did the old you know, DRM and pickups, yeah, and it just like, all had to be old, and all you then, would sit there and stare at weather checking all day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and then you study logos. Right. Of like, oh no, that's not a '69 because in '69 it does this and this, right. and, this and it's like and you get so and crazy it into it. The, the eye, the dotted eye, is a little higher. Right. So the. But it seems like almost that because I don't find that same energy in the vintage guitar world anymore. No, because now it's you know not to badmouth people who do it, but like no. there's so many guys doing it that aren't terribly knowledgeable, you know, like, and there's a lot of really like kind of you know. Beat up it's just turned parts, into, guitars. Yeah. It's just, and they're, you know, the economy crashed. So, and there's just too many people dealing those guitars who don't know what the fuck they're talking about. You know, so like, it's just not as exciting as it used you to don't be. Get like, it so like when obsessed. you walk into like Lark Street Music and you talk to Buzzy, like, that's, you're, you're going to church basically. Yeah, right? you know, like, and he's the coolest fucking guy, you know, like, yeah. but anytime, like, it's a only guitar shop I still go to. Well, only because it's lo local. Yeah, I go yeah. to Chelsea because I yeah, love yeah. Chelsea. And like, Retro Fret in Brooklyn is kick ass. I mean, there's great guitar They're shops great out there. there. But, you know, when you walk into like Lark Street and Buzzy's there and it, you, it's, you know, like, it's like when you used to walk into Chelsea, oh, yeah. like... you just get the goosebumps. There just aren't that many left. Like, some guy who's been, like, in the guitar business for three years and is telling me about vintage guitars, like, not to toot my own horn, but I worked in a guitar shop. By the time I got out of college, I had more experience in this. Yeah, yeah. You, know? <laughs> you know, like, it yeah. takes a long time. Totally. You can't just buy a vintage guitar shop and never have worked in one. Yeah. You know, but there aren't... There, you, you can't work on them anymore. Totally. It's like, you know, yeah, we were, we've caught it right at the I've, end. I, I mean, I feel like... Yeah, I really caught the tail end of it. Right, but it was still really happening. It was you still know, there. I caught the tail end of it to really we were both compared were... to all those other cats, like exactly. you know, like guys when Peter Florence and all those guys were hanging out. Like yeah. you know, then then it was popping. These guys just, were dealing so, with like they were just used gold guitars. Every day. Those were just used. Or they guitars. were becoming vintage, but the shit was everywhere. Yeah. And you could make money at it and you could, you know, be inside of like Chris Mojo, you know, like you know, like these guys yeah. were inside of Blackguards every day. 
You know, like yeah. that guy knows more about guitars than I'll ever know. Yeah. You know, like he knew more about like, guitars than I'll ever know in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's just a, but that's when he like introduced me to Moss. I was like, all right. Yeah, well, Mojo, like, oh, I would love to have on the podcast. Yeah, it's like, like Mojo's the most interesting. I talked to him yesterday. I, I love Mojo. You know, he's doing something else. I think he's doing real estate. Yeah, like, yeah. But, you know, like, but the, there's the, those guys. But, yeah, he hooked me up with Moss. Like, you guys need each other. And right. we've been sitting next to each other now for eight years. Right, well, he was always like it's like, that. what the fuck? Mojo's like, yeah. just like, he's one of those magical people you meet in this business. Yeah. Yeah, you know, there's so many of these cats. You know, but they were really from like the generation before. Totally. Not that he's even that much older. Now. Yeah, yeah. He's a little older, but like. But they've been doing it. But they, he was doing it for a long time before yeah, I yeah. got involved. And you know, Peter like, with Retro Yeah, friends, or, you know, it's like Peter Florence. So knowledgeable. Like, anytime I'm on the phone with Peter Florence, Hours. you're learning shit. Yeah. Right? And it takes. And yeah. And, <laughs> but he's the coolest guy, but yeah. like, you know, but. You know, like he knew less. You know, uh-huh. he knew. That's how I know Peter, and that's why we share this affinity because we were both loved less. Rick McCurdy came by the shop Love the other day. McCurdy. He's the best. <laughs> but he's and less he was guy. telling me less stories. Right. And well, I'm like, oh god. Well, he told me less was the first guy who would throw him work when yeah. he first moved to New York. You know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and Rick McCurdy is the shit. He's the best. He came to Moss's birthday. I saw party that picture. Day. Yeah, the best. But I want him on the. That's yeah. why I want to do this like podcast, like to because a lot of people don't know who Rick McCurdy is, and he's he's just, the man. He's just an incredible yeah. guitar dude, and he's building the, actually the new really high end D'Angelo house, which is awesome. That. But and you then, know, me and Night Bob went to his place. You know, like downtown yeah, to yeah. see his guitars. You know, they're just because I was. I, was going to do something, and I was like, hey, Bob, let's go down and see, you know, Rick McCurdy. He's like, oh, I'd love to see that stuff, you know, like, yeah. and the stuff is crap. It's just untouchable. It's great. But he was like, you know, like, retopping Les Pauls for Les, yeah. you know, back in the day. That way back. Like, all these guys, I met yeah. Peter through Les and all these people. And I'd be really fortunate to have been any part of that. Same here. Like, I, like, you guys are all uncles to me, like, right. and, and Night Bob, guys, like, telling me about crazy shit, and like, yeah, just you can just like wait that Bob on the podcast. Just, just listen. You just <laughs> anytime like I, I called this one guy, Scott Lentz, who's the Scott Lentz guitars, but there's the son and the father mm-hmm. I found. Because I just happened to get a Lentz guitar. Yeah, yeah. Someone could sign it with me. I didn't know much about this model. I'll call the company. And I just happened to get the father on the phone who started the company. Yeah, yeah. Who knew Peter Florence all those kids from the seventies. Wow. Yeah. And I talked to him on the phone for two hours. Yeah. Easy. <laughs> just, he just talk and like because those guys will talk if you're listening yeah, willing yeah, to listen. Totally. They're willing to talk. Yeah, that, there's no secret. You know, and that guy told so, me he was like the first guy who could shoot butterscotch in the seventies properly. And everyone sent their shit to him. You know, and, and the lens yeah. guitar happened to be incredible. So yeah. I'm just consigned to it. I always heard lens Han and then guitars you, were these the best guitars. And then so once consigned when you, you play, you're like, whoa. Yeah. This is like a Shiohan guitar. Like, yeah, this yeah. thing's happening. The finish was just happening. Cool. But my friend didn't remember. He ordered it, but he didn't remember a couple things. So I was like, oh, I'll call the company. Yeah, yeah. I'll see if I can find out what year it was. Or I couldn't find out how much it was worth because they don't yeah. make this model anymore. I was like, oh, I'll call the company. You know, they're probably cool. And the father I got on the phone, he's like, oh, yeah, my son built that guitar. You know, like, but the father was like talking to like Peter Florence or something. And he knew Peter, you know, because that's awesome. From that. You know, like thing, and he was just so interesting. Yeah, that's the best. And you know, talking about Gibson during that period and yeah, all yeah. these things, Paul Reed Smith, you know, and all these things yeah. that were going on was so cool. Totally. You know, and then that's what's so interesting about this whole thing. That's why I feel so lucky with the shop, too, of being surrounded by you, then having in the shop Moss, who's had tons of history, and then Eric. Right. Labello, who's, who's worked with everyone, right. well, so we get all these your guys. Your place will be Chelsea Guitars to someone else. Yeah, and we get all these guys like yeah, some Rogers young kids going to work at your place and hangs and like right. we get all these crazy guys. But you, your place has that that Chelsea vibe, and we all seem to like want yeah. to do that. Totally. After working at Chelsea, you just thought that's what guitars were. All but it about. is. But it is. It is. Right. <laughs> it definitely is. You don't think it? It is, and that's why we're we have that. And then, but to a lot of people working in a guitar, like if you work in a guitar set, I hate to like keep. Saying bad things about it, it's but it, different. You know, it's, it's just it's, a job. But it's a it's a corporation, so it's different. You know, they can't make it cool. They can't make it funky. They're yeah. just not. It's not. It just doesn't lend itself to that. It totally. Can't be that way. There's too many yeah, it's, things in a corporation that can't make. Yeah. You know, you can't show. This up is just the opposite. Late, hung this over is, every single fucking day, and it'd be cool. Get fired in a second. Right. Yeah. You know, you just can't make prank home phone calls all day. Totally. You know, which, and this is like our thing, and just being so obsessed with the guitars. And then what we're even doing at the shop soon is that the guitar showcase, the guitar builder showcase. I know, and I can't and make it. Have, uh, but you Josh, guys are doing Josh that coming, stuff. And we're gonna. It's all about yeah, bringing the Josh community Brody together. We got you know, McCurdy, we but that's got what's Mike about Tobias. community, and that's what's got lost. Yeah, you know, like <clears throat> you know, the vintage guitar dealers used to all know each other. You hang out. You know, and it's, we just really want to guitar bring everyone back Now it's together. like all these people I don't know. Yeah, you know, they've been in the vintage guitar business for three years. They own a giant business. 
Totally. You know, I'm not buying a guitar from that fucking guy. Yeah, yeah. How's he gonna know? Yeah. You know, like, you know, it's so hard to tell vintage guitars now whether they're right or wrong anyway. Like, mm -hmm. You know, like, you got some guy who's been doing it for three years. Yeah. Yeah, he's got a bunch of money. He's going to go out to a guitar show yeah. and buy shit. Good luck with that. Yeah, I'm not dealing with that. Because, <laughs> you, know, like, you know, all these people, like, you know, oh, I could tell this and that. Like, I've been doing this a long fucking time. There's things... I mean, I know people who can make like, shit I know that what you I can't can fucking tell. Right, exactly. <laughs> if you make a guitar you, and you know vintage guitars, you could do that. You know, and I can't fucking tell. So There's like people who go crazy. And people have been doing it since the 70s. So now those guitars are legitimately old. Yeah. You know, so like, how are you going to tell? Like an old Les guitar, like... Right, from... Dude, that he did in 1972. That's a real, exp that's a a real explorer then, at that right. point. <laughs> You know, that's it's terrifying. It's Arena. Right. There's probably PAS in there, just because that's what they, were, they were around. around. Right. You, you Who figure knows? it out. Yeah. Right. You know, it's, it's just, it's too big a can of worms. Yeah, yeah. That's why, I, I like doing the boutique thing, because I don't want to have to deal with that, like, with yeah. my own money. You know, like. Horrifying. Oh, this yeah. is fake, now it's worth nothing? Right. I'm fucked. Good thing I like the guitar. <laughs> right, but, you know, it, it, it could happen... You know, like, even, you know, back at Chelsea, like, the stuff wasn't fake. It's no. just, like, it was more of, like, it was reefing. Well, there was, like, the Ralphie stuff, though. Right. But it was all But you knew right that stuff was fake. Yeah, yeah. You know, like... But then he would get, like, the old lap steel parts and put them in, and, like... That was meant the whole dating the pots thing. It was like, oh, that's I all you needed to know. I have one of those tellies, you know? <laughs> And it's fucking awesome. Yeah. I always tell that story. He was selling those all over the place. Yeah, you go to Guitar Center. Oh, it's a real telly. Read the pots. Right. 1952, it's an early one. <laughs> and I have, because at the same time he was doing that, I wanted like a no, because the no-caster relics had just come out. He's like, fuck that. He's yeah. like, I'll make you one with real parts. Right. He's like, I'll take it. And it, it, you know, for the same money. Yeah. He's like, just give me like 2,000 bucks and I'll make you like the best <laughs> fake telly you've ever seen. Yeah. And I still have it. That's And awesome. it's fucking. Yeah, I remember that one. He did a nice job. Yeah. You know, like, so there's a million of those out there. And I know what store bought them all. <laughs> so too. don't buy your guitars there. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, who, how are you going to tell that guitar is not real? You know, someone like, you know, because he knew all the real shit. Yeah, he knew he all the marks right to things. put in there. Yeah. You know, those things like, you know, like like Mojo. And those guys know that. Like, the way the channel router came through. They exactly. knew shit no one else knew. Because the, the, they've seen the machining and the right. templates. But, you know, but then again, if you know to look for that, you would put it in yours. You would buy an old 50s channel router. Yep. You know, that's where it gets so convoluted. You know, like, but, you know, Jay Scott told me an interesting thing because he was the Gretsch guy mm -hmm. and he would be called to, like, make the call on a white penguin. Yeah. You know, and it's, you know, it's a priceless guitar. It's whatever, 200 grand. At the yeah. Time. There's only 10 or 15. So he's paid to say yes or no. Yeah. And I'd be like, do you ever not know? And he said, this is the thing. When you open the case, right says right. Every single and time. And you know it in your heart, and we've and seen it, it. It just says it to you. And if it doesn't say that... Then you question. Then you look at it. Then you look at it. It might be have some overspray. It might be complete might bullshit. Be but right always says right. And th that's the way I've always done it. Like, when you open a right guitar, you just know it. Yeah. When you open it up, you just the know smell. no one's dicked with this yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, like, yeah. You know, like, and then if it doesn't say that... Then you do your research. Then there's a question. It could even still be right. You know, not to say that that's going to work every single time, but you're better off erroring that way. You know, like, but right usually tells you, like, oh, man, look at this. Like, yeah, no screw hasn't been turned. with this thing, yeah, right? Yeah. You could tell when you're taking part of a guitar that hasn't been taken totally. apart. Yeah, yeah, you look... Yeah, like, you just know, you mm -hmm. know, like, sometimes. But could that be faked? I don't... Yeah. You know, at if this, you could get one, point, you could fake it. You know, like, point, that's yeah. why I don't trust myself. Yeah. You know, with $50,000 on the table, am I going to go make that call? I'm not going to... It's too much stress now. I'm not into it. You know, like, yeah. and you could say, I have as much experience at this as... I'm way more than most guys doing it. Yeah. But I'm not risking it. Anymore. I know. You know, like I would, you know, go call some. You know, I run to Buzzy a lot. Yeah. And anytime I go to Buzzy, he's like, "Oh, you know, can you come back here?" <laughs> like, what do you think of this? Yeah. I'm like, oh, I don't fucking know. But it's just that thing of respecting the time put into the craft. Yeah. Of you've seen so many of these things. But I think you, once you see enough of it, you realize you. Yeah. You know, it's like you. Can you tell? I yeah. Don't know. There's always some. The fake guys have gotten so good. And now a lot of those are so old that yeah. there's just no way to know. Yeah. But I think we're probably at the point where we should 
wrap this up. Although we could talk all day because I, I don't get to. S a lot of the times, like I don't get to see you that. Day, <laughs> I know. You know, so this is more just like catch up and have fun. Like because I haven't forever. seen your guitars or any of this. Yeah, so yeah. everybody else who's watching this with us this is, is doing day. the same thing. But we're you know that's what I'm really enjoying about the podcast yeah. is people I talk to on the phone. You know, so I don't really get to spend time yeah, with Yeah, this it. is the best. Yeah, so everyone else, you get to have a beer and talk about guitars, yeah. and I get to see all your new shit. And then when you come back next year, there'll be all yeah. kinds of other new shit. Then your record will be out, you'll yeah, tour yeah. again, you exactly. know, and you'll have different guitars. Yeah. So that's what I think is going to be fun about this in the long term. Totally. It's like, oh yeah, Cobra's been on it three times in the last five years. <laughs> you know, yeah, five years yeah. from now, you'll have all different guitars. Totally. Yeah, you know, that's why I think it's going to be really fun. No, it's going to be great. And the, this is like the only only the eighth podcast. I think it's only really six podcasts because two yeah, of them yeah. double. But I've been really been enjoying it. You know, like, and it seems people seem to be digging it. Oh, so this is great. I love it. So you have to come back again me. the next time. Big time. And yeah. Doug, you're the best. <laughs> <laughs> and we hope you guys enjoyed our podcast. And again, um, these podcasts are available on iTunes and YouTube, and you're probably watching it on one of those two, so you don't really need to say that. <laughs> uh, but uh, my website is mountaincatguitars.com, and you can find Copenet. <laughs> Copenetti? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Uh, Carbonetti Guitars on Instagram and Facebook yeah. and at the Guitar Shop in New York City. Yeah. And thank Coming you very up. much, and we'll see you again soon. See ya. Bye. <laughs>